Hey everyone, so a little while back I made a reaction video to uh, a creationist video. It was uh, a channel called I Am Lucid. He made this ridiculous anti-evolution video and I reacted to it and it was the first time I'd ever done that format and I said in that video that if people enjoyed it that I would make more content like that. And uh, this was uh, like a year ago or so and it got about a million views so I think that people pretty much expressed uh, the sentiment that they did enjoy that. So I think I think it's time to do another one and uh, I want to stick with the with reacting to creationists because they tend to use talking points that are very easy for me to debunk off the top of my head so it's not like Discovery Institute stuff where they I have to read the primary scientific literature and, and explain how they're lying about it they tend to use stock talking points that are just absurd and very easy to debunk very quickly so um a lot of people had, uh, or not a lot, but you know, five to ten people had had t uh, told me about a guy named Sabur Ahmad, uh, uh, I think is his name, and uh, so he's a Muslim uh, creationist, and in particular, a few people had linked me to this particular video that I'm going to look at right now, and so uh, I wanted to uh, take a look at it. My prediction is that Muslim creationists say the exact same things as Christian uh, creationists, uh, so we're going to find out, but I thought this, this would be a very good opportunity to try the reaction format again, because it's much less work for me. I don't have to do as much with the edit, uh, but I still get to kind of go through and give you sort of a, a, a quick, uh, d uh, off the cuff debunking here. So, uh, I learned my lesson last time. This is, it, it does, uh, get a bit trying psychologically. So I, I brought the, the scotch this time. I'm actually, it's, it's a little late. It's 1130 PM for me right now now and the video is is an hour 40 so this is actually I think I'm gonna regret start, starting this at the at this time but I'm a couple drinks in and I'm going to um, we're just gonna have an enjoyable e uh, evening here so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start this video and we're gonna go through it I don't know exactly what's gonna happen um, we'll see how, how uh, frustrating it gets but I'm gonna go through and we're gonna do a debunking and um, we'll see what happens so uh, let's go ahead and so uh, let me tell you what this video is. So this is a video called Muslims Scientifically and Rationally Dismantle Evolution. A guy named Mo Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali and Sabor Ahmad uh, Abbasi. Uh, the, so the guy, the Muslim lantern, I don't know who the other guy is. I know that other people have told me to debunk Sabor Ahmad. So we're going to watch this video. It's pretty long. Uh, there Maybe there will be pockets where I can fast forward because they're just sort of waxing philosophical or something. Or maybe I'll be able to, I don't know. This could end up being four hours long. I have no idea what's going to happen right now. But um, I felt bold in this particular moment in the wee hours of the night. And so we're going to do this right now. So here we go. Uh, I'm starting right now. Okay. Sure. Shall I share the okay. presentation and get yeah, started? Yeah, that's fine. That's oh, fine. So, okay. Okay. So the theory of evolution, fact or fiction. And I want to say something important here, right? Why is a fact, right? Something that we need to keep in mind, right? Now let's leave the definitions of philosophical definition, jargon, and all of this stuff. We're not going to get into that. Generally, when someone says something is a fact, they say that there is no doubt in that thing. There is no doubt in it. We agree on it. You know, uh, it's, it's a fact that water is wet. We're not going to get someone in the future who's coming, going to come and disagree that, you know what, no, 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 water. I'm not sure really that water is wet, but no, no, it could be wet sometimes and sometimes it could not be wet. Fact is a fact. So what happens is in the scientific community, what they do is that they sell you evolution as a fact. No doubt about that. You go to universities, if you study in university. Okay, I just... Biology, it's already <laughs> oh, hang on. a fact. <clears throat> I, I just already have to jump in because they're doing kind of the flat earther thing of not understanding what these words mean, fact versus theory. Uh, anytime somebody tries to frame uh, a situation in which fact and theory are antonyms, uh, they very clearly have no idea what they're talking about. A fact is an individual datum, right? Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. That's a fact. It's an individual datum. A theory is a model that correlates data and makes falsifiable predictions. So whenever people contrast fact and theory, 
you can immediately know that they have no clue what they're talking about. Uh, let's continue. People believe evolution is a fact, right? So what I'm going to try to demonstrate now, is it really fact or is it the opposite of fact? Is it fiction, right? And I, I want to say something important, right? There are a group of people, just before we get started, I want to make two points, right? First thing is that there are people who've already made up their minds. If you made up your mind, if you if you were willing to will, to actually open your mind and to listen and to see what this person is going to present to me, then this kind of stream I would say is for you. If you already closed up your mind, it doesn't matter what this guy is going to say. It doesn't matter what he's going to bring up. Again, I mean, I just like we're a minute in and I'm already seeing so many parallels to what flat earthers say. You have to open your mind. You have to have an open mind. And it has nothing to do with an open mind. We know that the earth is a sphere. This is factually known. Evolution occurs. Evolution factually occurs. We observe it. We know that evolution factually happens. So it has nothing to do with an open mind. Uh, this is just rhetoric to try to prime people to reject science that is very well established uh a lot of flat earth stuff going on here yep. you know i'm not gonna accept what he says he doesn't know what he's talking about look at this arab trying to tell me this and that right? if you already made up your mind then this stream is not for you so i'm making it clear and simple for the people I don't want people are watching two minutes and then go on the comments oh but this and this and that watch the full thing once you you watch the full thing then say what you want to say the second thing i want to say is that what we need to do as muslims is, is very important here we cannot be on the back foot we cannot be on the back foot when it comes to evolution. What do I mean by that? Evolution is not our claim. Why are we trying to disprove something which is not our claim to begin with? I'm saying from the beginning, if you're moving from this perspective, you've kind of already lost. What you need to do is to ask that other individual to demonstrate to you why this is a fact. If I'm talking to someone who believes in evolution, like other than what we're going to do today, if I'm generally talking to someone who believes in evolution, the onus of the claim is on him. He is supposed to demonstrate to me evidence is why evolution is, is true. But what That's tends right. to happen, yeah, what tends to happen in our conversations, we assume, yeah, yeah, okay. He said, uh, we assume evolution is true, even though we don't agree it is. And then we start defending why we don't believe in evolution. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's a, I see that's the biggest problem that we have today, right? We yeah. need to understand, look, the other person needs to come and give me the evidence, they must uh, can demonstrate evidence to me. But, yeah, we, we do that all the time. The problem is that you guys ignore all the evidence or you just lie about it uh, and then continue spewing your rhetoric. Um, but pretty sure we're going to get into that shortly. In front of my eyes, look, this is the evidence why evolution is true. And then I can maybe think about, okay, refuting the evidence that he's bringing forward, critiquing it and this and that. It's like you, me starting a conversation with an atheist and then him accepting the assumption according to his worldview that God exists and then I ask him this proof God. Would any atheist ever accept that? No. So why are we, why are we doing that? That's a good example. That's a very good example. Yeah, subhanallah. Yeah. So why are we doing that? Hmm. You want to say something? Yeah. No, no, no. Exactly what you said. I, I, I love the way that you put it. You know, if a Christian comes up to me and um, they are, sorry, not Christian, sorry, a Darwinist comes up to me and they want to put the onus on me. I'm going to say, no, the onus is on you. You're the one that made the claim. I'm the one who... Stop saying Darwinist. Can you guys... You're doing what the Discovery Institute does. Stop saying Darwinist. Darwin lived in the 19th century. When you say Darwinist and you pretend that that word encapsulates modern evolutionary biology, you are illustrating to everyone that you don't know what you're talking about. And fine, the onus is on biologists and they have presented a wealth of uh data that you refuse to engage with so that's why you get mocked uh that's that's why that's happening and who's silent you're the one that's claiming there is a universal common ancestor it was a blind random process so what you did right now i think will give a lot of people confidence because they know that they can just sit there fold their arms and they need to wait for the other side to give the presenting case and all they Absolutely. need to do is challenge Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is what I'm saying. This is what we need to do from, from from now onwards. We cannot be those people who are like, yeah, yeah, okay, evolution is true. Let, let me try to, to explain. You're already yeah. defeated, man. <laughs> what are you trying to do? You're already defeated. 
<laughs> like subhanallah, we defeated in a battle that we never we never started anyways. Sometimes I do that with the existence of God, but that's a different discussion for a different day, you know? But generally, yeah. this is the idea. The person he's got to demonstrate to us why evolution is true. Now, let's move on in thought, inshallah, to what, to what we're going to talk about today, okay? Right. So we've got what we call quote-unquote evidence, right? <laughs> so I'm putting it in quotation marks for a very important reason, right? This is what people in the Darwinian field will present to you as evidence. I don't know if there's anything else that we can consider to, to be evidence anyways, but let's say this is the bulk of what, what is considered to be evidence. This is the main topic. This is the most important thing. Obviously, fossil record, uh, vestigial organs. We'll go into what vestigial organs are if, if someone doesn't know. Homology, and obviously the natural selection is the blind processes that happen based on your environment for survival and reproduction, etc. cetera. Uh, we've got random mutations. The mutations happen randomly and all of the story. And then we've got similarities in genes, humans and chimpanzees and different animals with each other and all of that, right? Then lastly, we're going to talk about some rational problems that we have, the, the, the theory of evolution as a theory, right? And I'm going to go into an important thing later on for I mean by the rational problems, okay? okay? Let's go on to the first thing, inshallah. Okay, so the important thing is this. Darwin, when he put his theory, in chapter six of his book, obviously here, Origin of Species, chapter six, difficulties in the theory, right? He put this chapter about the, the problems and difficulties that can come up with his theory, etc. And he said something interesting here. He said, but as this theory, uh, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. He put forward this thing, which every evolutionist com comes, up to, uh, to, comes up to us with as well. And I will explain why they come up to us with this idea. They say that, look, there's thousands of, of uh, uh, creatures, there's thousands of animals, thousands of things which have evolved on a long, 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 long gradual period of time and gradual process that took billions and millions of years. Why is this important now? Because the people who will deny this today based on certain individuals, they still, when we ask them, can you show us a transitional creature today that have, have evolved? They always use this excuse of gradualism. So when it suits them, they say, oh, this takes thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of years. But when it doesn't suit them, they say, oh, yeah, yeah we don't have to believe it took a it's, it's a long process. And I, I need you guys to. I don't even know what you're saying. Transition, transitional creature that evolved today. I, I don't even under like he's mixing a lot of jargon. Like there, there are many, many transitional forms in the fossil record, countless transitional forms in the fossil record. So. He's setting up a lot of rhetoric to try to dance around that. Let's see if he even acknowledges it. To pay very close attention to. Because you will see in everything that they present, there's a contradiction. They self-contradict themselves literally in every action that they do. Okay? Okay, so Darwin here, he said that we need to have this massive amount of transitional, fossils of transitional creatures that we, whenever we get, you see here is different levels here. Obviously, you've got the Cambrian, etc. All of these are different levels in, in the soil. And because it was a gradual process, then when we go in the first one, we will see the latest creatures that have evolved. When you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you'll find now less evolved creatures the more you, you go deep. So this is what the theory is. Not, not less evolved, just more basal, right? And, and that is indeed what we see. Like he's <coughs> focusing on Darwin because that was the middle of the 19th century, right? He, I, like, there's been 160 years of paleontological research since then. Uh, my prediction is that he will acknowledge none of it and continue complaining about Darwin. Let's see. This is a general understanding of how the fossil record works, right? So Darwin himself knew that we're not finding all of these transitional forms. So he continued to say, the, he, for, after saying that they must exist, so he is making the claim, not us. He's saying that they must exist based on the idea of graduation, uh, uh, gradualism and uh, slow evolution, etc. Then he says, why do we not find them <laughs> embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? He's asking the question on our behalf, right? We don't need to ask the question. He's asking. Now, how did he answer the question? It is okay, I don't... <laughs> he asked that 160 years ago. So why don't you look into what paleontologists have unearthed since then that have answered that question? Uh, I'm, I bet we're not going to get a lot of that. It's hilarious how he answered the question. He said, I'm going to talk about that. It will be more convenient to discuss this question in the chapter on the imperfection of the fossil record, basically. He made, he made a chapter. He said, the fossil record is not, is not perfect. How does that justify what, what you what, what your theory or anything? 
This is exactly how science works, right? Darwin came up with a model and he admitted that there was not yet enough data to completely support some of the some of uh, some of what he was uh, proposing. And so now you look at what biology has accomplished in the 160 years since, right? Look at the specimens that have been unearthed in all of these strata in ways that completely support evolution, right? I, of course, you're not going to look at them. You're not going to look at, there's a picture of a trilobite here. I can't wait for you to talk about trilobites and uh, we'll see what you say about those. Anything that you said that has nothing to justify your thing. That cannot amount to the claim that you guys may make. There's innumerable amount of transitional forms and creatures. We need to find them. They have to be, when we be, when we finding all of these creatures, we need to be finding all of these fossils that lead us for a fact the evolution took place. Why are we not finding it? Right? Then we had what we what we call a very interesting thing that brought even this brought even more problems and problems on this idea, which is the idea of the Cambrian explosion, right? So we've got this layer here, pre-Cambrian and then Cambrian. We've got something called the Cambrian explosion. We found so many fossils from that period. And all of these fossils, they do not support the idea of gradualism, uh, gradualism and that creatures took all of this time to evolve on this and that. We found all of these creatures. So we find this... Uh, trilobite. Uh, trilobite. Trilobite, yeah. Trilobite, sorry. Thank you. So this trilobite is an example that we found from the Cambrian period, right? This is a very advanced creature with multiple different eyes, and mm. it has nothing to do with the idea that this gradually evolved and took a, or this very, very, very long... We shouldn't be finding it in the Cambrian period, right? We should be Why? Why shouldn't you be finding it in the Cambrian period? What are the animal forms that predate the trilobites? Do you know? Are you trying to make the claim that the trilobites are the first animals? Are you trying to pretend that there is absolutely no animal form that predates trilobites? Are you aware of Precambrian animals? Are you aware of Ediacaran fauna? Do you know about uh, Dickinsonia and Charnia and Kimberella? Do you know about the animals that predate trilobites? If so, why aren't you talking about them? That's a joke. I know that you don't know about them. Uh, you're pretending that there's nothing similar to trilobites prior to trilobites, but that's because you don't care about this. You don't actually try to learn anything. All of this is very common knowledge among paleontologists. Even I know it. I'm not a paleontologist. So um, you should know it if you're trying to talk about these things. Finding it maybe in the in the territory period or all one of these different periods but it should not be in the cambrian period this is one example we find multiple 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 different fossils and what did what this did is it completely destroyed this idea of gradualism so they started to us with this idea of gradualism now no longer we can accept this idea of gradualism we have to find a solution how can we find deep within the earth in that very 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 long period uh, these uh, extremely evolved quote-unquote creatures how can we explain this phenomena Okay. okay, so the, the look, <laughs> they're they're taking a page out of the Stephen Meyer book here. So this is what creationists do, right? They take they take the Cambrian explosion and they go, This is crazy, it's an explosion, and all of these animals showed up in an instant. They they exploit the connotation of the word explosion and they try to make it seem like all of these forms uh, arose literally instantaneously. It didn't. Of course, the Cambrian explosion was a period of about 40 to 80 million years, depending on which radiations uh, you include in, in, the, in, in, that, in that event. Um, it was a relatively long period of time, right? 40 to 80 million years is still a pretty long time. Now, admittedly, evolutionarily speaking, it was still a very, uh, 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 like, a, a, a wide number of body plans appeared in this time frame. But there's an evolutionary explanation for this that they obviously are not going to talk about. There are new environmental stimuli occurring during this time period, and that was the emergence of the concept of predation. This was the first time that predation was occurring. It was the first time that animals were hunting and eating other animals. That's a very strong environmental stimulus that is going to uh, cause more rapid evolution, right? There's going to be uh, an exploitation of, of newfound uh, uh, characteristics that are advantageous for survival, and then those are going to pro proliferate more strongly. So... Uh, there's just a lot going on here. They're pretending 
they're, they're just doing the normal creationist thing of like, you've seen an image of like the Cambrian explosion and it's a literal like boom graphic and then like animals tumbling out of it as though it's like a divine creation. Um, and it's not, right? There were animals prior to the Cambrian explosion and the ways in which they uh, evolved and then continue to radiate make perfect sense in the context of evolution. They just don't know anything about it. That's all. How can we account for that? Then what, 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 what we find, we find someone like Stephen Jay Gould. I don't need to say who he is. I'm sure he, he's very well known, right? On his book, sorry. Let's go back. You, wrote, <laughs> you wrote Stephen Gay Gould. So I don't know if that was a Freudian thing. On his book, The Panda's Thumb, right? What he says is, it is sudden appearance of species. Okay, can you explain? Yeah. Can you explain why? <laughs> can you explain how? Can you explain? So what they started saying is that, you know what? It's not that all of these things have evolved because we found different things like ants, for example, that have not evolved and all of that, right? All of these different fossils from the Cambrian period. It, what? Not everything evolved? Ants? Ants didn't evolve? What are you talking about? What is it about ants? What are you, what are you talking about? What are you saying? I don't even understand. There's no explanations for it. So what they did is that they shifted the goalposts. They said, you know what? Some uh, creatures, we, they will have sudden appearance, sudden sudden evolution, quick sudden evolution, while the other ones will take a, a gradual and tra transitional period without giving any justifications. What is the justification? Yeah. We found something that goes against our theory. Now we're going to shift and twist and change what we were saying into trying to fit this new information into our theory. Okay? <clears throat> but no, that's not what biologists do. You're talking about you're talking about gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium, and uh, there look, <laughs> there are different set. Evolution occurs in response to environmental stimuli, right? Sometimes environmental stimuli change very rapidly. Sometimes they don't change so rapidly, right? Sometimes there are periods in which the climate is changing very rapidly. There could be uh, the atmosphere could be changing. Sea levels could be changing. Uh, there could be stimuli that are changing very rapidly, and that in turn causes more rapid evolution, right? It's it, Natural selection is just selecting organisms that are best suited for their surroundings, for their environment. If the environment is changing very rapidly, that is going to hasten more rapid evolution. Then there's also periods of stasis, right? There are definitely organisms that have remained relatively unchanged for many, many millions of years, tens or even hundreds of millions of years. And that is because they continue to inhabit their environmental niche very successfully, right? So it's evolution doesn't say that everything has to be changing all the time. It says that things that, it, that, that inhabit their environmental niche successfully will proliferate. And if that environmental niche doesn't change, then there's no impetus to change. There's no stimulus to change. Right. So uh, when conditions are changing very rapidly. And so, again, I said before that when predation came about, it's the first time the animals are eating other animals. That's a big deal. That's going to cause very rapid evolution because there's going to be a high premium on things that can evade predators. Never prior to that moment did any organism have to evade predators. That's a new thing. So already there had to be, OK, we need metabolism. We need ways to sustain biological life. Now predation is a new thing, right? That's what the Cambrian explosion represents. That's the primary factor there. This has a lot of problems. So as we said, they're not giving us why. Not giving us reasons and evidence behind them, given this idea that, okay, some of them are like this and some of them are like that. The second thing is how. How would an animal or a thing evolve very quickly, suddenly by itself, by random, random processes? How does that happen? I mean, <laughs> I, th I feel like a course on genetics, like a genetics 101 course would probably be lost on you. But uh, there are there are ways in which organisms can change very rapidly due to random mutations They're called macro mutations. Um, maybe we'll get into that later. So you were given the excuse. This is a big issue now, right? Because they were given the excuse of natural selection. This happens for a long period of time based on the environment and this and that. So how can you account for this very sudden, perfect 
uh, evo evolution, if you want to use that term, that happens at the southern... Uh, at the... No, I don't want to use that term. That doesn't mean it. What, perfect, perfect evolution doesn't mean anything. At, the, at a certain time, suddenly. How can you account for that? How can you explain that? And what we would say is it's impossible to explain. For example, animals like giraffes. Right? What they said is that they didn't have that long neck. They were trying to eat from the trees. So they were extending their neck. Extending, 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 and through a gradual process, their neck started like stretching. You know how ridiculous these things happen when you start to actually listen to their claims, right? And then it started to stretch. Why? Why is that ridiculous? That giraffes' necks got longer is ridiculous. Why is that ridiculous? You're just giggling and saying it's ridiculous, right? That like this is the thing is like creationists are always like <laughs> they always do a straw man where they're you know it's like the kent hoven thing how did a pine tree give birth to a whale or something like this kind of thing that evolution doesn't say and you're always about oh new kinds new forms right you didn't get a new form this we're talking about giraffes we're talking about a feature of giraffes gradually growing that's not even what is so ridiculous about that i would like for you to explain to me what is so ridiculous about giraffes necks getting longer over time what's ridiculous about that let's stretch, stretch until it started reaching the the leaves and started eating from food now why is the problem there is if we assume sudden evolution are you trying to say to me that the blood vessels the bones tissues the heart everything related to bl to blood evolved suddenly all together in the perfect manner that the giraffe is not gonna die let alone now to go what what do, you, what do you mean what do you mean evolved suddenly nothing had to evolve are you saying that there were new types of blood vessels are you saying that there were new body systems are you saying that there were new anatomical features you think that a blood vessel elongating as the neck elongates is somehow runs contrary to evolutionary principles tell me about about uh, the the about fetal development of a giraffe how do the blood vessels form during fetal development of a giraffe if you don't know the answer to that question and i know that you don't how are you in a position to to say what is possible as giraffes like generation to generation a neck getting a millimeter longer every thousand years how how does that require some mass evolution of new body systems that that blood vessels need to get a tiny bit longer what are you even talking about to speak about the the breathing system of the giraffe and all of these things if there is a sudden evolution that took place how come that happen that all of these organs and everything in the body changes in the perfect way in the perfect time for the, for that creature to survive without nothing is changing in the perfect way in the perfect time or anything it's just the neck of a giraffe it's a giraffe neck it got a little longer very slowly over time that's all any external factors now, that's a claim I want to ask Stephen Jay Gold if he was here, you know. I would ask you that question. Can you account for how it is possible for a, an animal like a giraffe, which has all of these massive changes? If you looked at the uh, blood system for a giraffe, how the blood goes from the heart to the brain in all of this long neck, you'd be, you'd be shocked. Are you telling me that, oh, just random chances? Okay, this is the first thing that we want to talk about, okay? Let's move on. So the first thing we said is the, is the Cambrian explosion. So what we said here in the Cambrian explosion is that they did not found those species. With the testimony of someone like Darwin and other people, they did not found those transitional creatures. If they did find them, we wouldn't have anything to, to contest anyways. You don't have anything to contest because we did find them. There are thousands upon thousands of transitional forms, and you will not acknowledge that because you won't look into it at all, and you don't know that they exist because you don't want to know. We would say, okay, the, then you've got all of these different fossils. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, now we uh, we look into what you guys are saying. Okay, but they don't have it. So what did they what did they do? If we don't have something, what do we do? Like the Christians do, you know, some some Christians, you know, they make it up. So if I don't have a verse in the Bible that supports the Trinity, we will make up a verse that supports the Trinity. I love this like 
this shade that the Muslims throw at the Christians. Like, we're both religion versus science, but our religion is better. The Christians are silly, right? The Christian uh, creationist apologists, oh, they're buffoons, even though we just use all of their time. Like, I, uh, I'm, I'm only, a f how, this is, we're 13 minutes in to an hour, an hour 40. Why did I do this? This was a horrible idea. The, there, uh, I have heard, they've said nothing that I haven't heard from Christian apologists yet. They have the exact same script, and I would bet a thousand dollars that they will not say anything in this entire video that isn't directly derivative of, like, answers in Genesis or something like that. Um, and yet they're still like, oh, Christians, oh, or we're the smart ones. It's ridiculous. It's the same idea with science. We don't have evidence for this idea. What we will do is that we will make up evidence for this idea. So let's go go on to look at some of the links in what I would call clear-cut forgeries with their own uh, uh, testimony. And I want to say something very important. Look, I'm, all the magazines that I'm going to put forward here are magazines that actually support evolution. What does it mean? They, they accept evolution to be a fact. They are well-accepted scientific magazines in the scientific community. I'm not going to bring you creationists, quote-unquote. I'm not going to bring you books of people who already deny evolution. I'm going to bring you their own testimonies about their own things. So if you're an atheist that accept the scientific community or you're a Muslim that you want to say what they say themselves about their own theory, we'll go on to look uh, one by one. So let me open the first thing, inshallah. Just give me one second and then let me share my screen. Okay, so and I'm going to go quickly because I'm not going to go into much details. You can go uh, later on. You can guys look at the links and go into much detail. Yeah, I bet you won't go into much detail. Details of each <clears throat> single fossil and why it's a forgery, right? So let me share screen for one second here. Share screen. Okay, so this is the first forgery here. Okay, okay. This fossil that was announced as the, as the missing link, as possible evidence, is what is a forgery, okay? That's the first link. Let's go on to the next link. Okay. Let me Wait, what? <laughs> let's go on. You didn't... What do you mean, let's go... What is that? What is that source that you just brought up? What does it say? The uh, the Archaeoraptor forgery, I don't, I don't know what that is. I'd like to know. Did you want to tell me about it because you just pulled up that source? What does it say? This is unbelievable. Okay, my screen and let me share another link. Okay, I don't, I don't want to go on too, too much into these different because I have so many, to, honestly, right? I have so many and I'm not going to tell you anything about any of them. I'm just going to pretend that they, that they invalidate evolution. <laughs> so many uh, examples, right? Okay, uh, reject all. Build them in, fa in famous what? Build down man, infamous fake fossil. Okay, and the the word is infamous. All of these things that they talk about here, they were using as evidences. If you open the t the scientific text, for the love of God, please stop saying evidences. Please stop saying creationists. Please stop saying evidences. Please, please. Books, you will find these things, to, uh, uh, quote unquote, claim to be evidences for evolution. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to a third link. So we're going to talk about even. Lucy a little bit more in details as well, but let's talk about Lucy quickly now. Lucy. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So, I don't know. It's always these cookies everywhere. You know? Wait, what was that? You just, you, you, <laughs> the, the rapid fire, it's like you threw up a thing about, Pil uh, about Piltdown, man, which all creationists do, by the way. Which does not invalidate evolution in the slightest, right? You're talking about uh, about a forgery that was exposed by the scientific community, right? It's a guy that lied, and then the scientific community was like, oh, no, you're lying. We're science, okay? Stop trying to invalidate science. And But what's hilarious to me is that this guy, okay, this is how this entire hour and 40 is going to go. I am predicting it now. This is already the second or third link that he just throws up, and he goes... See? Okay, we're not going to talk about it. Okay, go to the next thing. Like, <laughs> he doesn't even read these things. He doesn't even know what they say. Not only, um, obviously none of them invalidate evolution whatsoever, but he's not even, he doesn't even have the discipline to spew like the typical creationist script about each example. He just goes, this is the thing that other creationists talk about. I'm going to flash it and then jump to another thing. It's unbelievable. Okay, so... 
Baboom found in famous Lucy skeleton, right? If anyone knows about the, uh, the, the, the Lucy skeleton, we're going to talk about it in depth as well. Baboon founds are found in it. Baboon, sorry, baboon bones are found in it, right? Okay. Uh, now, coming back to the slides. Let's come back to the slides for a second. Oh, my God. <laughs> this guy, he just throws a... Okay, baboon... Do you want to talk about this? Baboon found in Lucy Skelton. What does that mean? Okay, so I'll admit that's news to me. I don't know what that means. Presumably, what that means is that in the collection of bones that constitute the Lucy specimen, perhaps a baboon bone was included in it. I have no idea if that's even true or not. But but there's so many things to talk about here. Uh, number one, how does that invalidate the Lucy skeleton? It doesn't. Second of all, of course he doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that there are literally hundreds of specimens of Australopithecine species, right? Lucy Lucy is the very w famous Australopithecus afarensis specimen. What creationists try to do is pretend that that is the only specimen of I mean, of that genus, or some of them tried to pretend it's literally the only uh, intermediate species in general. There are hundreds of specimens of Australopithecines, Austral Australopithecus afarensis, animensis, sediba. There are many, there are like 10 different, I don't know how many, there are like uh, 10 different uh, species known within the Australopithecus genus. Right. And and we're talking about many, many different specimens. So they go like, oh, this one bone, like, I don't even know what this baboon thing is because he doesn't even explain it. He doesn't even go through the article to say, like, presumably, I don't know. I'm not going to go read it later. Oh, of all the bones in Lucy, one of them turned out to be not from Lucy. But obviously the rest of the specimen is is intact and valid. But, oh, whoops, we made a mistake with this one bone. The guy doesn't even go into it at all. He just goes, look, oh, there's a thing. Okay, move on. It's like, what are you even doing? Yep. Okay, so all of these are articles saying the same thing. Sir. So I'm going to save you. The they are. You have no idea what these articles say. I don't think you read them. I don't think you read a single word of any of these. The time, right? <laughs> I'm going to save you that. Some of the, look, why Ada fossil is not the missing link. You can find it even in the link of the, of the thing. Say some statements about these things, right? So all of these are talking about. What's Ida? Do you know what Ida is? Do you know what? I mean, I made anthropology content recently. Ida is, it's an earlier primate. Spe it's not hominid. It's an earlier primate species. But how many missing link from what to what? What are you even talking about? You're not even clicking on the link. You've compiled this list of links and you're not, some of them you click on and don't read anything. Some of them you literally don't even click on. Well, the same thing. All of, all of it are forgeries, right? We had an example of here, Science Magazine. No, no, they're not. For, Piltdown Man is a forgery. Yes, that one. Not, no. These Lucy is not a forgery. This is absolutely ridiculous what you're claiming here. Uh, uh, claiming that there was a specific thing in the end it's a pig tooth. They draw that yeah. actual creature, the whole, whole creature, you know, based on one tooth. <laughs> one tooth. They drew yeah. an actual creature saying that that creature was called X, Y, and Z. He was walking and going out here. He was doing X, Y, and Z. And in the end, oh, sorry, we discovered it's a pig tooth, right? Let me actually yeah. open that link. Okay. okay, they're talking about Nebraska Man now. Uh, so, yeah, this is another case like Piltdown Man where claims were made and then they were uprooted by the scientific, scientific community. You're just outlining how science works. Right, somebody made a fraudulent claim, or not fraudulent, but, but I mean, I think they misinterpreted data. I don't remember exactly. Yes, there was a tooth, and then they presumed that it was a remnant of a of a of of a particular hominid species, and it turned out not to be. And guess who unearthed it? Right? Was it creationists with their brilliant scientific ability? Was it people like you who went, "Hey, no, I with my anthropological know-how, I'm going to uh, unearth"? No, it was the scientific community that goes, "No." No, this doesn't work right it's let's it's it's just the progress of science but look i'm only this is where i, I don't even know how okay P 
pig tooth. He's like on number 10 or something like this. He skipped so many. He's literally compiling a list of links that he doesn't even know what they say. But all, what all of this is supposed to mean, because they're creationists, is that there is no transitional forms from what they consider to be ancestral ape species and, and homo sapiens, right? Which is idiotic, right? Why don't you actually discuss real anthropology, right? From the from the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees or or other or, or you know or or other uh, such species, there are countless not countless, but there are dozens and dozens of hominid forms, right? You go Sahelanthropus chinensis. Uh, 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 10 Australopithecine specimens, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, right? There are so many species. You're looking at none of that, right? You're looking at none of the real anthrop anthropological data and you're going, ha ha ha, Nebraska man tooth. These scientists are idiots. Like you're not engaging with science at all. It's so blatantly clear how you are just intellectually bankrupt. You just have no ability to actually discuss real science. Let me open that link for a second. So it, it is like, uh, honestly, like embarrassing. That's what I would say. Yes, you should be very embarrassed. What those people do, when we find their mistakes, they try to even justify it for, uh, in a different way. Like, for example, look, you say, apparently not a man or ape. But you're claiming it is a man and ape, and it is, it is a missing link and all of that. So what yeah. happened now? What happened now, right? Okay, let's come back. Let's open the slides again, sorry. Yep. Okay, this is another example here, right? This, there was a part of a skull that they found. And, and they drew a whole picture again and all of that, and they said that it's a transitional creatures, etc. In the end, there was a skull of a donkey, right? <laughs> By the way, the, the time that they... And there was even um, uh, books uh, mocking that, magazines putting a man holding a stick and a, uh, with a donkey head, right? Mocking them, mocking the scientific creatures, <laughs> claiming that this was a transitional creatures between a human being, etc. Right? So it's a skull of a donkey, right? And they called it the discovery of the, se of the century at that time. <clears throat> I don't think anybody called discovery of the century. I I have never heard of this donkey thing, but w whatever happened, and I'm sure you're lying about it, whatever happened, whatever whatever er erroneous or fraudulent claim was made by an individual within the scientific community, guess who corrected it? The scientific community. It wasn't people like you. It wasn't clueless creationists with your non-existent scientific know-how who said, no, 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 look at your data. We can invalidate it, right? You're, it's the scientific community that like, you're just, it's, this is how science works. There are mistakes. There are frauds too. There are frauds in science and they're corrected. It's, it's a self-correcting process. So you're cherry picking errors and frauds and pretending that that represents the entire field of anthropology while refusing to engage with the field of anthropology. That's what you're doing. Hey, let's take a short break from the debunking so I can tell you about something interesting. For a while now, I've been working with a company called Learn With AI to help them develop a few things, one of which is an AP test prep app called TeachTap. They have an amazing team of developers, and what they've done is they've created a learning experience that uses AI technology to help students study for AP exams, and they've made it as easy and entertaining as scrolling on TikTok. Imagine learning science from the best scientists who ever existed, like Galileo, Newton, or Einstein. Imagine learning history from the historical figures themselves. Here's just a taste. Introducing TeachTap. Learn with the world's greatest teachers. Your time is important. So our AI-generated content targets your learning gaps with precision. We made an app that's not only smart, it's entertaining, with a variety of content types and thousands of AI personalities. PoopStep is easy to use. Just select your course and swipe to learn. You can stay a step ahead of your classmates and get an A on that test. It's not just possible, it's your next big win. There are so many great features here, like review questions, practice exams. You can even DM historical figures with questions and get personalized video responses. 
Everything is aligned to the relevant standards and the AI learns about you as you go, so it knows how to guide you through the areas you need the most work on. And you can do this in bite-sized amounts of learning whenever you want, without having to crack open dusty textbooks. Here's a list of the courses currently offered. In addition to some sciences, it's especially great for humanities, and there are a bunch more courses on the way. So again, the app is called TeachTap. It's free to download. Grab it from the App Store today and get on board the AI revolution so you can score big on those exams. Okay, back to the debunking. Which shows how these people use all of these false evidences to try to justify, as if they have evidences for what they say, when in reality they got... Stop saying evidences. Nothing supporting what they say, right? Yeah. We've got Hicker's drawings, right? If you speak to someone today, as I said to you, someone who a little bit well... Uh, learned about evolution and this and that. If you talk to him about Hickel's drawing, all he's going to say to you, oh, this is a long time ago, this few yeah. data, and this and that. that's what they say. But these are used in, in, in medical textbooks. Yeah. Until yeah. until 2013. This link I have, it's showing you how many textbooks it is used in. Okay, this thing with the Hickel's drawings, oh my God, it's so irritating. Um, <laughs> so, no, they're not used in textbooks, but, but guess, I mean, guess what is used in textbooks is actual images of fetuses. Because now in modern times, we can get images of fetuses in utero, right? We, we have that technology. Uh, and guess what? They look pretty much like Heckel's drawings. Like, yeah, there's some truth to the, to the, to the notion that Heckel uh, didn't, like, they're, like, I don't know if forgery is the right uh, word to use there, but they, were, they, were, they, they weren't exactly accurate. Uh, or, or, and they were, but the, the, <laughs> they look pretty much like what embryos actually look like. So we can take actual images of embryos. So you can stop whining about heckle and you can actually talk about embryology. I don't think that we're going to get there, but up to 2013, yeah. even though this idea was refuted in 1909. So, you know, Darwin's time, you know? So this idea was refuted at Darwin's time to be forgeries, but they're still using today in scientific textbooks and medical textbooks until 2013. No, they're not. But again, why don't you look at actual images of fetuses and talk about what those look like? Because we don't have to rely on drawings anymore because we can take pictures of fetuses. So talk about that. Are you now coming saying to me that they did not know this basic information that me, someone who's not specialized in the, in the medical field, knows? So, oh, not specialized. You don't say. I know that this is a forgery, but the people who are uh, doctors, professors that are writing books, medical fields, professors, teaching students, they don't know that this is a forgery and they still have it in their, in their medical textbooks. Or, or, or is it that they know, but they don't care? Or is it that they know this is fake? But they don't care, and they want to push forward whatever they believe in. This is, uh, the other idea that we had of the human tail, right? Say humans are born with tails, and you know, these tails used to be uh, from uh, apes and from all of these different types of animals. And in the end, it is a disease called lipoma, and there's many different names for that specifically. It's a, a skin disease where you have an extra part of the skin coming out, right? Yeah. No, that's two different things. We're not born with tails, as em we have embryos have tails. Right, embryology is remarkable evidence for evolution because we go through all these evolutionary stages of ancestral species. Right, that that's the thing is like, <clears throat> in terms of like many of the mutations occur that produce new morphologies, are are mutations that occur that affect the way in which the embryo develops, and so these changes they might kick in at certain times during embryonic development. So there are so many aspects in which human embryos develop where we see the uh, the remnants of ancestral species where we go we have the the pharyngeal slits, right, that do turn into gills and then for humans they don't turn into gills but they're pharyngeal slits and then you know there's tails and so um, there, there, uh, there, there's a certain time in embryonic development where changes have occurred such that they begin to develop in a different way that produce different morphologies. So this is tremendous evidence for evolution, right? Why the hell would an embryo develop like a fish and then like something else and then like something else to only become a completely different un and unrelated form, right? Why, why would these similarities in, in embryonic development uh, exist 
four 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 species that that don't resemble each other once they're fully developed right think about embryonic development um anyway let's see so what is it that i'm trying to show here is when they do not have evidence for something because they worship this thing as a religion that's why i compare them with christianity they <laughs> I the so the only fun thing about debunking Muslim creationists is I, there there's nothing new in the in the projection there they pro, they project their baseless faith onto science because they have a religion right they have a baseless faith in what they believe and so they project that on the scientific community but I really love this extra feature of them throwing shade on Christianity at the same time because they're like religion beats science but our religion beats the other religion like that's it seems to me so far to be implicit in everything they're doing which i just find to be incredibly amusing since they are using 100 percent identical arguments to christian creationist apologists they worship it to be a religion and their idea and their understanding this is like a, a religion so if i don't have evidence for something that i already believe in then i will make up evidence to support what i what i, what I believe Okay. Yeah. And I'll try to maybe, inshallah, maybe comment with my channel, put all of these links. There's so many links. That, so I'll try to gather all of these links for the people, you know, one by one, and then people can look at if they, if they want to look at it, inshallah. Okay. Uh, we've got now moving on to what I would call fictional characters. But first, I want to ask this question. Maybe that you can tell me, maybe if you know this common knowledge, right? Do you know when they say is the first appearance of Homo sapiens? How long ago? Do you know? Um, well, our species, they would say around 200,000 years. 200,000 years, right? One, 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 195, uh, five give or take, which is what you just said. So this is what they say. Okay, so this is the common knowledge, Brother Sabur. This is what, yep. they, what people are spreading. This is if you go to a person, this is what they will say to you. But we'll move on now to talk about this. Okay, well, I'm going to say also I'm calling them fictional characters, but, but not now. So Nature Magazine Research is what you said here. Right? Yeah. Area's appearance is 195, give or take five years. It's in this article that, uh, by Nature, right? Now yeah. we have a next article here by, by, by Nature. Actually, let me open this article. Now we have a next article that we, I want to look at here. So uh, let me share my screen. Sorry. Apologize. So we said what? 200. Yeah. Now they found one that is 300,000 years. Yeah. 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 300,000 years ago. <laughs> now what do they say? Moroccan fossil rearranges. Homo sapiens tree. So what they found, they are, uh, by the way, the, this 200 years that they had, let me close this for a second. This 200 years gap that they have, this 200 yeah. years that they got, they have the whole family tree based on it. Mm. So when the day, now we have to understand the significances of these changes that I'm putting forward now. It's not as simple as, okay, yeah, it was 200, it was going to be 300. No, no, no. The whole theory is based on that, yeah. <laughs> right? The whole evolution of the human is based on that because they have this gradualism, they have this periods. This person was in this specific period. What are you saying? What are you complaining about? Like, what do you mean? The What do you mean everything is based on, on this? What are you saying? Like, we have all of these uh, hominin specimens. We, we If you get specimens that are dated slightly earlier... You're just saying that the emergence of a particular species is earlier. Why does that rearrange the whole tree? Like, what are you saying? I I just have no idea what you're saying. Period of time. This this uh, uh, animal transitioned from the, from here to there. It gradually evolved in this specific way. So this is not just simple changes. This has to arrange, rearrange the whole family tree. Okay. So they said. Three how? How does it rearrange the family tree? What do you, you don't even know what the family tree is. You don't know what the species are that are directly ancestral to Homo sapiens. You haven't mentioned them thus far. So what do you mean the family tree is rearranged? You don't know what the family tree is. Family hominidae. What? Tell me about. Tell me about hominidae. Tell me when hominidae evolved. Tell me how many species are known within hominidae. Tell me about when they evolved and, and which are directly ancestral to others. Tell me anything about anything, right? You're, you're not saying anything about real science, but then you're saying science is wrong because of a thing that science said. It's bananas. 300,000 years. Let's move on to the, the, the next thing that they say, okay? Let me share my screen. So it's not 300,000 years, actually. It's according to this, 
is the first Europeans remains in Spain. It is actually 708, uh, 780 thousand years. Okay? So what, we, what do we have to do now? More rearranging. What do you have to do? <laughs> we have to rearrange again, right? There's no rearrange. You said, I don't rearrange and call it homo antecessor. What do you mean call it homo antecessor? It's a different species. Homo is a genus. Ante sapiens, homo sapiens, homo antecessor, homo neanderthalus, homo erectus, homo habilis. These are different species within the genus homo. Homo antecessor is not modern humans. It's a different species. So when you're talking about the emergence of homo sapiens, and then you're talking about homo antecessor and pretending that that is the emergence of homo sapiens, you just, like, do you not understand how Linnaean classification works? It's a different species. What are you talking about? It's musical chairs. Yeah, it's, it's musical chairs. Yeah? This chair doesn't fit here. Let's put another chair, right? Okay, let me show another example, right? Another example. And people don't talk about these things because they only talk about the 200 years. This is what they teach in universities. This is what they talk to students about. This is the old information that they still recycle until today, right? Okay, let's share screen again. Another face, look Look how they're putting it, you know? <laughs> look how they try to beautify it. Another face in our family tree. Actually, it's dated to 3.5 million years ago. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's, it's just another face in our family tree, okay? They, they're trying to put it in a way as, as if, you know what, there is no issues in that. We don't have a problem, you know what? What does the article say? What does it say? What are you talking about? Another face of the failure 3.5 million years ago. We don't even know what species they're talking about because you won't even, not only will you not read any of the article, you won't even click the accept cookies button to reveal the lower quarter of the abstract. Like you're so afraid of any of your viewers reading literally two, three sentences of the abstract to gain any information about what the study is saying. What species was it talking about? We won't know because we didn't look at more than the first four words of the abstract. Like you guys, you're talking to... <laughs> God. It's just unbelievable. Like go, like you know that you could like audit a, an anthropology 101 course. You could watch my anthropology tutorials and you could learn about what these different species are and what the lineage is, but you won't do it. You just pretend that none of these things exist and then you like flash the title of a paper and you're like, oh, this is another, what is like, I just don't even know what you're trying to do here. Okay, we were just telling you this, and the reality is not this, but okay. Let's do another one. Okay, and because I want to read a little bit of what it says here as well. Let's see the screen. The oldest member of the human family found. Voila. Okay, <laughs> you know. Uh, now let's look. To my uh, is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, on that could sink our current ideas about human evolution. It's not me saying that. It's the guy who found it, you know? Okay. <laughs> so I think that says would, yeah? It's not me. I'm not saying. Okay. Notice that this is not primary scientific literature. So this is not a valid source, uh, right? This is like somebody could, somebody could be completely twisting words here. But also it said human family. Again, like this is how much they don't understand Linnaean classification, right? You have species, you have genus, and you have family. So the human family is the hominidae. Human beings belong to the family hominidae, right? What else is in hominidae? It's not just humans. That's a big, that's an important distinction. Now, anybody who thinks this isn't going to get more complex isn't learning from history, right? Yeah. When I went to medical school in 1963, human evolution looked like a ladder. He says the ladder stopped from monkey to man to a progression of intermediates, each slightly less ape-like. Now, human evolution looks like a bush. <laughs> okay. We have a mangrove of fossil and hominized group. Okay. So why is he trying to say here? Why is he trying? You have no idea what he's trying to say. What? <laughs> okay. It's evolution is not a ladder. Uh, and he used the word bush. I mean, we use the word tree. You can use the word bush if you want. Uh, it means that there is a lot of branching. Right. Obviously, anyone who understands evolution knows that it's not rungs on a ladder. Right. It's not one species begets another, begets another, begets another, begets another in a in a in a directional manner to get a particular goal species. 
That's not how evolution works, right? There is a ton of branching. There are, there are many points of divergence, right? Certain populations beget newer species and this population over here, it's, it's a very broad uh, process. And then certain species will pro, pro, uh, proliferate more strongly by natural selection. And so that's why certain species are extant and many, many, the vast majority are extinct right it, so okay you can call it a bush you can call it a tree you can call it whatever the hell you want it's not linear right it's not everything trying to get humans uh it's many species it's very broad trying to say he's trying to say okay we had I, when i went to, to to university we had this family tree now because of all of these things that people are trying to avoid because as he says that you cannot avoid this. You cannot escape this. This is Don't think this is not an issue. This is what he's saying. Someone who believes in evolution who's propagating evolution. He himself is telling you this is an issue. He himself is telling you this is rearranging all of what we have. As you said, musical chairs. We arrange, rearranging everything. So first we found a problem with the idea of the fossil record. They make it up. They have any idea which is a contradiction. They change the premises. They, they change whatever they used to believe in into something completely different. And they claim as if oh, there is no issues, right? Now, this is another example of Nature Magazine, uh, 1.8 million. We found a, hand, a human hand bone, right? 1.8 million. So it's not 200 years. It's not 300. It's not 780. It's not 3.5. It's not 6.7, right? And uh, also in Asia, because some of them are saying all of these bones are found in Africa. No, no, there is an Asia. There is a Chinese bone that is found that is also older that is in the link that I put forward, okay? So what do we have here is fictional stories. Or fictional trees. <laughs> the guy, he's not like, <laughs> why are you compiling these links if you're not even clicking on them? Like, it's already pathetic enough when you click on the link and then don't even look at anything of what the article says. You're, you're not even clicking on the link. 1.8 million, 1.8 mil hand bone. Okay, 1.8 million year old hand bone. What is that? What does the article say? I have no idea what it says because you're not going to click on it. Okay, so we're talking about in the in the evolution of hominins, there was a point where the hand began to more closely resemble modern human hands. Wow, what a shocker, right? From Australopithecines, which were several million years ago and, and were more what we would consider ape-like, uh, there was a point where they became more human-like. Shocker. And so we're identifying the point where that happened. You're not even clicking on the link to see what it says. Like, you're, I know that if you clicked on it, you would have no idea what it says, and you'd have no ability, no ability to talk about it, which is why you're not clicking on it. But do you know how ridiculous and intellectually bankrupt you look when you compile this list of links and you literally don't even click on the link to show people to pretend to know what it says. You're not even pretending to know what it says. Trees, or fictional transitional cre creatures in fictional times that they put forward for the, to the people and they start drawing and they start rearranging for you one by one, telling you that, look, this is now the tree of the human uh, human family. You know, I think that the, the, the tree of of Pokemons have been rearranged less than this. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is what I would say. You know, this has be re been rearranged more than the, the, these people rearrange. Okay, okay. So uh, Pokemon are are fictional. They're truly fictional. So the tree of Pokemon is whatever the hell the people who made up Pokemon say it is. Science is different because it's real. So when we, when we find specimens and try to figure out what they are, it's very natural that there would be some discrepancies, some arguments, and that that would slowly shift or change, right? That some people would find new specimens and something would get shifted around because that's real. That's what happens when you actually do real science is that you get new data and then you update your scientific understanding. Uh, so bringing up Pokemon makes you look very, very, very dumb. Let's move on to the next fictional characters, right? So we have here fictional characters. I'm not going to even read, bother to read the first name. Yeah? That's why they called it Lucy. They changed the name from that name to... You... <laughs> Australopithecus afarensis. I'm like five drinks deep and I can say Australopithecus afarensis. 
uh, you're trying to pretend that all of anthropology is wrong and you can't even pronounce the names of, of hominin species. Let that sink in. Lucy, right? So those are the fain, four main one, ones that they use today. They moved away from most of the other ones. And now they focus on those four ma main ones, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo tenders, and Lucy, right? So L Lucy, here there is an article from Science Daily. It says that it's actually, it has an ape-like brain. And the rest of the bones that they have, they actually uh, uh, collected from different things. So collecting a bone from here, a bone from there, a bone from different country, and then assembling them together to try to have a human-looking like creature that evolved from, from something. Today you can do it. Okay, so so you're lying twice, right? Uh, they don't do that. They're they're not they're not assembling bones, right? They're not just like. It's not Legos, right? Uh, uh, anthropologists aren't like, hey, let me find bones from all over the world and try to put a thing together. No, they find, it, they're, they're paleontological finds, right? They find specimens and then, they, and then they figure out what the organism was. So they're not doing that at all. And then the second thing that you said was that make them human-like. They're, they're all they're they're no more human like than they are ape like what you would call ape like because they're transitional forms they have basal characteristics and then they have modern characteristics as well right that's their 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 by the uh, australopithecines were bipedal and then you've got the valgus knee the foramen magnum right there are many features of the of those specimens that make us know that they were bipedal, yet they had ape-like characteristics. That's how we know that they're transitional forms. You're refusing to engage with the actual data, and you're just saying, "Oh, it's all fraudulent." You're just lying again. I mean, why are we shocked? Why are we surprised that you're just lying? Uh, you're just lying. You can do that. You can bring a little head of a monkey and a hand of a human being and a tail of a rat and then gather them together and say that this was a creature that was evolving, right? Yeah, that's totally what scientists do. So they themselves, they say, actually, no, that's not uh, from Homo sapien tree. That's actually, it has an ape-like brain. Okay, we move to the Homo habilis. It's the same thing. Ape-like bones, right? We move on to the Homo erectus. Or erectus is the same thing. There's a link here that talks about sinking the Homo erectus. It's a whole research showing you how the Homo erectus uh, uh, is sinking. You know, because it's from erect, right? Erecting. So they're, they're, they're even making puns about it. <laughs> they're even mocking their own. <laughs> a pun I don't understand about research that I won't even read or show, right? What do the links say? Show us what the links say. Oh, you're not going to show us. Evidences, right? So you're thinking there is no evidence for for the Homo erectus as people are, are claiming, right? What do you mean there's no evidence for Homo erectus? We have hundreds upon hundreds of specimens of Homo erectus and Homo habilis and Homo neanderthalensis and uh, pre and, and and prior to Homo, right? Australopithecus. Like we have so many specimens, and you're just pretending that they don't exist. That's how pathetic you are. And here, in this Nature article, it says you, it could be from Homo sapiens, actually. It could be included in Homo sapiens tree. It's not really from the, it's not really Homo erect. This is actually from the tree of the Homo sapiens, right? You look at another research. Actually, let's open uh, this last one, Life Science. Let me, let me open this one. I can look at it for a second. Because I want to read some of the phrases that they have in there. And I want everyone to bear with me, by the way. I know, look, I'm going to present you a lot of things, but point I want to do is this, is I don't want to leave anyone excuses later on coming and saying, okay, but what about this? But what about that? I'm going to give you an, 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 a crazy amount of forgeries, a crazy amount of lies, a crazy amount of what they claim to be the evidence, how they themselves admit that it's not evidence for anything. And they still come to you trying to convince you that this is some sort of a accepted fact. Okay. Wait, what, who is they? Who is they? You use the word they over and over again. So, okay, so they are coming to you telling you that evolution is false while they continue to come to you to claim evolution is true. That's what you just said. What are you talking about? Let's look here, sharing this one, okay? Homo erectus, facts about the upright man. Yeah, let's look about the facts that they say. No, thank you, okay? I want to say something uh, important here. Let me see the part I want to talk about. Okay. Bird of mother only found 200 years on Mark's upland had longer range. Oh, yeah. What I wanted to say is this. Do you see this part? 
called Lineage. Yeah? yeah. I opened the same link a while ago. This part, part here called Lineage was in the beginning. But what they did is they, they took this part and they changed it with this. And I'll tell you why, because you're going to start reading now what it says, right? Why did they remove it from the beginning of the research? Because they don't want people to be reading this in the beginning, right? The lineage of... They don't want people to be reading a thing that is in the article that people read. Sure, that makes sense. Evolution in history of Homer Erickson and other homes is unclear. And it has been muddied further by, by, by recent finds. Okay? Homo erectus was once thought to have evolved from an earlier human ancestor known as the Homo habilis somewhere in East Africa is the start to it. Okay, false information. However, there is much disagreement about... False information, because I say so. ...about whether these populations are actually Homo erectus. Confusing matters more. After analyzing the new skull, okay, scientists also do not agree about Homo erectus directed... I can go on and on and on, right? Point I'm sure that you can go on and on and on humiliating yourself. You're, you're looking at the conversation occurring amongst anthropologists who are debating what the precise lineage is of hominin species and which fossil remains contribute to which populations among those hominin species. And you're pretending that that internal dialogue among anthropologists somehow invalidates the evolution of hominins. That's insane, right? You're taking this conversation among professionals who all unanimously agree on the evolution of Homo sapiens from earlier hominin species and pretending that their internal dialogue somehow invalidates the entire purpose of all of their work for the entire field of anthropology. And the way that you do at, the, the way that you do that is just like kind of quickly reading a few phrases and giggling and moving on really quickly because you know that you don't even understand what you're reading. And this isn't even primary scientific literature. This is just like some article and you're just like, ah, I have no idea what that says, but that's silly. <laughs> it is, they don't want that to be in the first page because if that is in the first page, what you see is just further confusion upon further, further confusion. Yeah. Okay. So let's close this, this page. Let's go back to the research. And I'm sure, look, people have heard these names. Yeah. This is what, what atheists come up with talking to you about. They assume they ex existed. I've seen you talking to maybe an atheist who believes in evolution. He starts mentioning these names to you as if they're facts. They are facts. It's not an assumption. We have hundreds of specimens of these species. Right? Deal with the data. <laughs> right? Like, what are you... You're just pretending that these specimens don't exist. You're, it's a fantasy that you're living out. You're just saying, nuh-uh to the entire field of anthropology. It's what flat earthers do to physics and astronomy. You're as dumb as flat earthers. That's what you're doing right now. Right or wrong? He says, you actually have done that and they've actually done that. Okay, but this is what your na nature magazines are saying. Yeah. This is what your own research is saying. Okay. Now, uh, the homo, I'm not going to even mention that. <laughs> I'm not going to bother, right? The last one. This is called the demise of that what they were ever that I just, like the 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 way that you shirk the fact that you can't pronounce these things homo neanderthalensis like why you're pretending you're pretending to understand anthropology better than anthropologists and you can't pronounce homo neanderthalensis that's pathetic that species is called. It's the demise yeah. of it. It's the research here showing how it is demise. It is 151 research reviewed, put in that research that I'm putting for you, showing you how that is, it is the demise now of this idea of the existence of the homo neanderthals, etc. I guarantee you that's not what it's saying. I don't know what showing 151 means. This is just something that he wrote. I don't, and we're not going to find out because he's not even going to click on the link. So I guarantee you that whatever that link says does not prove that Homo Neanderthalensis didn't exist because it did. Uh, we're just not going to know what that means or what it says because we're, he's not going to actually engage with it at all. But point is this. If you go to any university today, they are teaching you these things are facts. 
Yeah. They're not teaching you that these things are not are not uh, are, are contested. They're confusing. They actually, oh, these are not bones of, of of humans. They're actually bones of. They're not bones of humans. They're bones of other species, and they're not contested, and they are facts. I don't know what else to tell you. You're pretending that all of the homo. You're pretending that Homo erectus is supposed to be humans. What are you talking about? These are ancestral species. You have so little ability to, I mean, it's just breathtaking. It's breathtaking to listen to you fumble your way through lying about things, about science that you won't even show as you're talking about it. It's bananas. Apes. They're not actually uh, what we used to say to you. It's not actually true. Uh, all of these fictional drawings and movies that they make, literally movies, right? It's a movie about Lucy that the baboon skin now. So it is a whole movie about it, right? <laughs> Showing you all how she used to live and what she used to do and all of that. Yeah, when we look at the morphology of, of Australopithecus afarensis, we know about its mobility, right? We th th <laughs> this is what this is what trained professionals can do. They can look at bones and they can look at joints and they can look at how the bones lock together and they can know that it's bipedal they can know about that how it is a a, a, a mosaic of arboreal and and uh, and and bipedal traits they can know based on its morphology what it does right this is what scientists can do because they're smart and trained uh, neither of which you are uh, so that's why you can't do that. What is it? Oh, I'm sorry. There's a car alarm going off right now. Hopefully it'll stop soon. It's coming from an ape brain. Do you get what I'm trying to say? I have a collection of different fossils from different animals from different things. Now, these fictional characters, why am I calling them fictional characters? Because they literally are. Imagine construct. No, they literally are not fictional characters. We have hundreds upon hundreds of specimens of these species they exist uh you want them to be fictional because that levels the playing field with the fictional characters that you worship constructing a full character from a tooth that later on you found out it's a it's a pig tooth and you you have this fictional character come i even children they have less less imagination than this to be honest you know even dc movies and all that, they have they are more plausible than these things that they're putting forward to be honest they are more plausible okay let's move on now we have something called vestigial organs. What is vestigial organs? Vestigial organs, and I want to say something important here. Vestigial organs is the claim that there are organs that are useless. They're not useful for, for, for survival and reproduction. They're not useful for that animal because they're left over of a previous, a previous ancestor. Like, for example, if me, I had a tail, for example, yeah? See? Okay, just to, to preemptively, because I know what he's going to do here, not necessarily useless, just not used for what the ancestral species used it for. So for an ancestral species, it had this particular function because its vestigial doesn't any longer perform that function. It may have evolved to perform some other ancillary function. That doesn't mean it's not vestigial. This tail is not helping me <laughs> survive a reproduction, but actually it's coming from previous ancestors. That's why it's still there. So that is the claim. Now, the, the first thing I want to put forward, and it's a very important thing to look at when it comes to this idea of vestigial organ, it is based on circular reasoning. Why is it based on circular reasoning? Now, that's very important to look at now. Because they claim these uh, uh, organs are vestigial, they're useless. Why? Because evolution is true. And evolution says that all organs must be used for survival and reproduction. Because evolution is true, they're vestigial organ. And because they're vestigial organ, they're evidence that evolution is true. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not circular at all. We compare, we look at what ancestral species use the organ for, and then we recognize that that function no longer persists in extant life. There's nothing circular about it. You just don't understand what, what it, you do, just don't understand what it means. Oh, I want you to look at this circular. People don't think about that, but this is circular reasoning, literally. Yeah, you understand yeah. what I'm They say vestigial organs are evidence for evolution. I'm not making this claim. Yeah. They make this claim. I will, let's read it here. Uh, 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 why evolution is true, right? By Jerry A. Coyne, right? He has in page 60. What does he say? He says, we humans have vestigial, vestigial preachers proving that we evolved. The most famous is the appendix, right? Which, by the way, I just put a research from 2018 showing you how it is very useful. In fact, there is a research under it saying how appendix sa could save your life. <laughs> how it actually saves you from certain diseases that will kill you. But the point is that this is circular reasoning. 
they're claiming they're vestigial because evolution is true and they're vestigial therefore they're proving evolution is true how are we not challenging this nonsense <laughs> you know how are we allowing this nonsense to go by you know okay so that's the first thing i want to say this is this is a secular reason okay now the claims that they make is also lies like the appendix for example is a, is a claim another claim is the inverted dress it's not look you're, you're you're running right past the appendix because you have no you you don't know what the appendix does and you don't know what the appendix used to do right the appendix is is an evolutionary remnant from from ancestral species it's a digest like they're herbivorous species that they needed to, to digest like bark and like you know that that was a, that was what the appendix the purpose of the appendix served it no longer serves that purpose now yes there definitely is research that shows that like in like the appendix plays a role in the microbiota and things like that that's not that shocking from an evolutionary standpoint you have this vestigial remnant it still exists Right? That doesn't mean that it can't serve any evolutionary purpose moving forward. It's just that it no longer serves the purpose that it used to. That's what vestigial means. It doesn't mean literally useless. It means does not serve the purpose it once did. That's what it means. And the eye, which is very sophisticated, very useful, and I'm putting the research here, showing you how it is super useful for the human eye. And then you got someone like Richard Dawkins in his book, uh, uh, The Blind Watchmakers, claiming it's useless as evidence for evolution. Because it's a vestigial organ, according to him. Okay? You've got the whale pelvic bones. And I want to say something very important. We've got research, that, that, that link that I put. We've got research 150 years ago, Brother Sabur, saying that they are useful for mating. And then we have a book today, Biology by Ravens and Johnson, taught in universities. 2017 edition still has that, has that information. Now, my question is, can you please tell me, I already mentioned one example like this, right? But can you please tell me, have they missed a, a research that have been done? One, even that research I'm putting now that is recent, they're quoting that research from 1,500 years. Well, sorry, 150. 1,050, 100, 1,050, 100 years. There, there's, you're pretending that modern biologists don't know what biologists 150 years ago knew. That's what you're doing. Whales in particular, you're talking about the pelvic bones of whales. Okay, there's like an the the way that whale mating. Okay, they serve a purpose. It doesn't matter, right? You're talking about pelvic. Like, look, what is the what is the purpose of the pelvis in terrestrial mammals? We're talking about hind limbs. What is the what is the purpose of a pelvis in in most mammals, right? What is the function of the pelvis? It does not serve that function in whales. That it found an ancillary function is absolutely not relevant to the fact that it no longer serves the purpose that it once served. Okay, so this is and I'm sh and uh, there, is there are they going to talk about snakes? Is there snakes on here? Yes, snakes. They're going to talk about snakes. So yes, it's the exact same thing where 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 species have lost a particular anatomical feature, right? But then some aspect of it pervades that is absolutely irrefutably vestigial. And just because there is some ancillary function, it doesn't mean that it's not vestigial. It does not any longer serve, right? Why do snakes have the remnants of features from animals that had legs? They don't have legs. Right, so why do they have those feet? It doesn't matter that they now serve some function, right? It is still vestigial. That's what vestigial means. Two years ago, are you telling me those professors in universities are supposed to be editing these books, teaching them to students? They do not know that there is 150 years ago research showing how these pelvic bones are actually used for for mating for for the whales. Therefore, they're no longer, as they claim, vestigial organs. 2017, this book is, is, it is being taught in universities, okay? And you've got someone like uh, Richard Dawkins. He's claiming, oh, look, this is evidence for evolution. You've got Stephen Jay Gould. He's saying the same thing. All the people that you see, you hear the biggest names pro propagating evolution. If you open their books, these, these are the things they're using. Brother and sister, I'm not bringing you something from... Uh... Vestigial features are absolutely evidence for evolution because it defies the concept of design because why would something be designed to include features that that do not serve the function that uh, that it served in ancestral species that absolutely demonstrates how evolution could work.
right? You have, we're talking about features that absolutely comply with evolutionary predictions that do not in any way comply with the concept of design. It is 100% uh, evidence for evolution. Last century, yeah. I'm bringing you that what they write in their books claiming this is evidence for evolution. And I'm bringing you their own magazines showing you how these quote-unquote evidences are actually not evidences. And how they're lying, ignoring research 150 years ago completely as if it doesn't exist. Completely. Now, look, uh, uh, le let me open this link to show you an example of what they say. Let me show and uh, open one more link. Uh, sorry. Okay, let me get to where I stopped. Okay, let's open this link here. So many links to open for you guys, but I don't want to. I don't want to keep this, you know, for thousands and thousands of views. And by the way, this so many links, so many links that I compiled, and I will look at none of them. Right, it's the facade of diligence. Right, look at all these links of science that don't say anything that I pretend they're saying, and I and I won't even show you what they say, so that you won't know that they don't say what I pretend they're saying. I, I want to be honest. This is not in, an in-depth research that I put forward, by the way. You don't say. I, I yeah. or organized this this because Brother Sabur recently just told me that he wants me to come on. I literally organized all of this today. A few hours, I put everything together. If you li you, really... You are lying. You are lying. <laughs> You've been compiling this for a long time. You want me to put an in-depth research of the amount of lies that these people put forward? I can do that. But wallahi, this is just a few hours today. Wallahi, I, wallahi, I done this today. I can go into the dates, show you me putting all of this information today. This is not an in-depth research, brother. This is, this is a basic surface level showing you how these people are lying. Okay, let's go here and share and share this thing. Let me show you one thing here. Interesting. I want to show you what they say, what they're saying. Okay. What they say? Where production is all in the hips. New study, new study. Look, that we already we said 150 years ago there is information about this. New study that that uh, turns a long accepted evolutionary assumption on its head. That's what they're saying, brothers and sisters. So this is not what I'm saying. What assumption? What what assumption are they talking about? Do you know? I bet you don't. So why are you talking about it? Why are you giggling like you know the assumption that it's that has been turned on its head? As though it is as though it somehow invalidates evolution as a whole. Because it doesn't. So what are you talking about? This is what they're saying in their magazines. It's saying that it's turning this evolutionary assumption. While 150 years ago, I'm telling you, this information has been already, people have been sleeping and they know this information, you know? The, the actual professors, they know this nonsense, okay? You, you're, <laughs> it's so blatantly obvious that this is all you have, is cherry-picking phrases that you think support uh, a denial of evolutionary principles when they objectively don't. Anyone who understands literally anything about biology knows that we're just talking about ways in which we're enhancing our understanding of evolutionary biology, and you're pretending that that process invalidates evolution as a whole because you have no idea what you're talking about. Now, uh, we've got another example of snakes, pythons. You got a book, Essentials of Biology. Again, taught in universities. 2018 edition. There's a research 50 years ago already showing how the, the, the hand, what they call the hand limbs are actually hooks used for fighting and mating by the pythons. While they will claim to you, to you today. Hooks? What are you talking about? Hooks? Uh, that's, that's, that's a bunch of bull. In 2018, in their books, and what you learn in university, probably people, some people watching this, they might be learning in the university. Yeah? I want you to open your textbooks that, that you, you're, you're learning from. And you go to the page of, of vestigial organs and you will see these things I'm telling you about in these books. Yeah, 2018. 50 years ago, there is a research debunk. 40, sorry. 40 years ago, there is a research debunk in that, but they're still lying in 2018 in their books, claiming that, you know what? This is evidence. This is vestigial organs. You've got penguin wings. You've got the ostrich wings. I can go on and on and on, right? Point is, as I said, I just collected some of them. I don't want to go into extensive detail. You don't want to go into literally any detail. You won't click on the links to see what they say. Extensive detail. You have no clue what any of this research is saying. You've compiled a list of links for no reason to appear diligent when you have absolutely no clue what any of these things are saying. Point is, there is anything that they would claim to you is vestigial organs. 
there is a function for it and there is research demonstrating and there is a function for it but they will lie and they will still claim it's evidence like i just showed you jerry coin in his book evolution is true claiming to you the, the the famous he he says the most famous is the appendix he's claiming it's the famous that people are sharing that the appendix is useless and i've already got research showing you that it can save your life they're not saying it's useless and it's still vestigial you know so by their own <laughs> their own nature magazines okay let's move on Let's move on, okay? Now we've got something here called homology, right? Uh, maybe some people have heard about homology or not, but okay, what is the idea of homology? Homology is the idea that the similarities between creatures in anatomy are due to common descent, okay? Is this my claim? No, 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 I'm bringing you what they say in their books, okay? Essentials of Biology, 2018 edition, page 247. They say the unity of um, anatomy is evidence of common ancestor. I'm not saying that, they're saying that in their books, right? And they say here, homologous structures suggest common, uh, uh, common derivation, right? So they're claiming that biology by Ravens and Johnson, Essentials of Biology by 2018. This is recent things. I'm not claiming something from the last century, yeah? Okay? So that means what? The more similar the creatures are, the closer they are, are in relation. Am I correct in my understanding, brother? Uh, doesn't that mean the closer they are in the looks based on this information? You're muted, by the way, if you want to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was muted. You were in a flow, and I didn't want to stop you. But... Yeah, yeah, no problem. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, when you get going. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I appreciate I mean, that a lot. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, what you're saying so far is 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 the concisest way to explain these points. Because the deeper you get, it can actually get more confusing. Absolutely. But that, that that's the crux of it. What you just explained. Okay. Yes, I'm sure it's very confusing when you don't understand high school level biology. Here, inshallah. Okay, Let, let's move on to the next point. Okay, okay. So here, what do we have? Can you, can you, sorry, spell these two because it's easier for me to say Mashimia and Jirobiat. You can spell the, the two, the two in, on the top. Yeah, you can spell. Uh, ma marsupials and plas uh, placentals. This can you is, explain uh, to the people the difference between the two? Okay, so you have two different types of mammals here, and these are geographically distinct, right? Mm -hmm. You you get some in. Uh, r remote parts of the world which are completely unrelated to the others yet they have similarities in terms of their traits and anatomical features which to the to the untrained eye you would say these two creatures are related but it's actually according to them independent convergent evolution okay, he, he was asked to define the difference between marsupials and placentals He's unable to do it. Mar marsupials don't have placentas, right? That's the main, like, it's pr that's kind of what the first thing you would say when you're asked that question, I, I feel. It's mm -hmm. not actually due to common ancestry. And that totally smashes this idea that similarities are due to common descent. Because we have to remember, everything goes back to concepts. So if similarities are due to common descent, that means that differences must be due to separate ancestry. And that means that if there's similarities that are found that are not due to common descent, then that undermines their entire thesis. No, it doesn't at all, actually. Right. There, there, there are similarity. The, conversion evolution is the thing. Right. There are there are superficial similarities. Like, for example, eyes have evolved like a dozen different times in the animal kingdom. Uh, wings have evolved separately in uh, insects first, and then uh, birds, and then uh, and then in mammals like bats and things like that. Um, there are similar evolutionary pressures that produce uh, similar features, similar anatomical features. That's not always uh, a, a direct indication of common ancestry. Right. Obviously, everything is related if you go far back enough, but very recent com uh, common ancestry. Um, we're talking about similar environmental stimuli producing similar features. Right. But we have other ways of doing it. like there's genomic analysis where we're not just looking at like, oh, these things look kind of the same. So they're the same. That's why uh, in phylogeny is in constant flux. Right. That's why within each phylum, we're always moving around the taxa within because we do uh, new studies and we're figuring out that this uh, was used to be its own phylum, but it actually needs to be branched under this thing, right? We're constantly moving these things around because you can't just go, oh, they look, they look similar, so, so they're, they're cousins, right? Um, it's very complicated. Uh, all of this is lost on these two, I'm sure. Um, this is something I, funnily enough, had a debate yesterday with um, uh, oh. Skydive Phil, 
<laughs> in the park um, because they don't tell us about these probabilities. They don't tell us about the assumptions that they're making because the fact is, if you start off with assumptions, whatever conclusions you make are going to be based upon those assumptions. So a lot of these examples that you're actually giving, these examples only go on to highlight the assumptions that they have in the beginning, why they're er erroneous. But even if Muhammad, you never had these examples, it would not change the conclusions that we are currently arriving at. Absolutely. And the, the, the basic difference between these two, two types of animals is, for example, kangaroos, they have the baby, they still hold it in, in, the, in the sack, and then it still feeds and comes back until it's ready to come out. While other animals will give birth and the, and the animal will be able to go by itself and, uh, after, after the birth is given, right? So that's the difference between the, these two types of animals. And they look the same. Now, the same book that I quoted biology in, by Rivenson Johnson in the previous page that said to us here, that these homologous structures, they are evidence for common descent. The same book has given you an image of animals that look exactly the same, but it claims that they're not for common descent. They don't look exactly the same. What are you even talking about? What does the book say? Did you read it? I don't even know what you're talking about. What bigger contradictions can you have reading this book? I don't know how people are opening these books and reading them, and they're not realizing, you know what, man, what's going on here? In the previous page, you were telling me, the more they look similar, the more evidence that they are from common descent. descent. The picture they gave me later on is, oh, they look exactly the same, but you know what? They're not actually from common descent, right? And you've got all this picture that I put here, the picture next to it, showing you where they separated, right? So the, uh, according to them, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add to that point that the same problem that you just highlighted exists at the genetic level. You get sequences which are I'm so similar. Okay, yeah, okay, so good. Okay. I'm come to that. No worry, I, I, I've prepared for them beautiful things today. Don't worry. Yeah, I can't wait for you to pretend to understand genetics. Right. Marshall, so, 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 okay, moving on now. Look, first, they said to us what? Similarities are due to common design. We give them an example that the homology doesn't work and they're lying. And that's what most laymen, they think, oh, these two things look the same. Therefore, that's what the guy was saying to me in the video if you watch it. Oh, they look the same. Therefore, they're from common descent. That's what laymen think it, uh, it, as evidence, right? Okay. So they say to us similarities are due to common descent. In the same book, they contradict themselves. Okay, moving on now. We said similarities are due to common descent. We've got the re this research from nature showing you how they separated 160 million years ago, uh, those two types of, of animals, and that they're not uh, uh, closely related because they separated a long time ago, okay? So the question is, why are they homologous? They cannot find an explanation, so they make up a new thing. They call it conversion evolution. We've got a solution now. The answer to that question is actually, it's not just, just similarities are due to common disease, but some animals, because of the environment, they will evolve to look like other animals, even though they're not from common ancestry. So which one is it? What do you mean? Which one is it? Like, what are you not getting? Like, there there are adaptations that are valuable, and they continue to be valuable whenever it occurs. Like, flight. Flight is a valuable adaptation. If organisms can figure out a way to fly, that is valuable, and then that will be selected for by natural selection. So it's not that surprising that insects and then birds and then mammals like bats or the, the flying squirrels or whatever over here, well, they're more gliding, they're not flying, but it's not that weird that these things would evolve multiple times, just like eyes evolved multiple times. We're, we're looking at valuable features, right? Why, why is it so surprising that these could evolve separate times? Uh, it's not that weird. So uh, convergent evolution, homology, these are completely different concepts, both of which are evidence for evolution, by the way. You're confusing them in order to try to invalidate both of them at once, and it's not working. Our similarities use common descent, or are animals based on their environment looking the same as other animals because the environment shaped them to be th this way? Okay? The answer is, oh, some animals are like this, some animals are like that. Sorry, we found this problem, so now we're going to make this new theory, and we're going to call it conversion evolution. There you go, okay? Now we move on. We say to them, okay, what about the bats and whales? They're not homologous in, in their anatomy, in their outside structure, and they are from different, uh, from different environments. The conclusion, according to what you said to me, because it's environment or uh, structure, that they are closely related, right? Why are they similar according to your own <laughs> testimony? Why are they similar? Why do they have this 
ecolocation system, both of them functioning the same way in th these two different things. One is a land animal, one is a sea animal. Yeah, wh okay. <laughs> Why did echolocation evolve more than once? Why did flight evolve more than once? Why did vision evolve more than once? Because these are valuable adaptations. It's not that weird, right? It, we're, all we're doing is showing that life is consistently adapting to find new uh, features in order to be able to take advantage of some uh, environmental niche to have, find some unique uh, aspect that that it can that that f uh, with which it can proliferate, right? That's all it is, right? It's not that weird that uh, that's that functions could evolve to take advantage to to develop new senses or to or to ha to develop new features, right? This is what evolution does, right? Why why would we expect that 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 life only figured out flight once? If it figured out flight once, why wouldn't it figure out flight more than once? Why wouldn't it figure out other times? And in fact, it did. Again, insects, birds, mammals. So it's like, just what are you not getting here? Like, what are you not understanding? Now, can you explain this to me? Can you, expl can you give us an explanation? Of, of how to, to kind of reconcile between between this, these things. They said, oh yeah, there is actually a new type of convergent evolution that you'll find in this research, research down here. Well, actually you can get these type of similarities between animals, even though they're not from the same environment, and even though that they're not uh, homologous in, in their shapes. So wh how long are you gonna be moving the goalposts, you know? You took the it's not moving the goalposts, you just don't get it. Goalposts with you home, literally. I don't know what you're going to do with the goalposts anymore, right? And we ask the question, why are animals similar to bats? Living in similar environments did not develop the ecosystem. Why are animals similar to bats? What? Why is it only the whales that, that do that, while the animals that live around the same environments as the bats, and they are similar to it, did not develop that same ecolocation system? Now, this is, can you, can you explain that to us? Because there's an element of random chance in evolution. This is like Kent, I did a debate with Kent Hovind, and he goes, "Why?" <laughs> he goes, uh, "Why didn't rabbits grow wings?" He said this to my face. Why didn't rabbits grow? What do you mean? Because they were they were they fit their environmental niche. What do you mean? Why didn't like you can't like evolution isn't. A, a, a magic wizard where you, where you get magic powers. You open up a chest and you go, oh, I developed flight, right? You, you, it's, it's limited by biology, right? Biology has to stumble upon these things, right? As valuable as echolocation or flight or any of these things are, it's not that nature is sentient and can just decide to develop them. It has to wait for random chance to stumble upon them. And once something happens, and it only takes a little bit, right? In terms of eyesight, all you need is, is a couple of photoreceptor cells, a, a, a bundle of photoreceptive cells. Right, that's all it is. Something that can, it's a little more light there and a little less light there. That's it. And that's already something upon which selective pressure can operate. And then more, more uh, uh, complex structures can, can evolve around that. Or you get a lens in a cornea, and like, or that happens over many millions of years, where you get sophisticated ocular structures. But it starts with photoreceptive cells. Same with echolocation. I don't know how echolocation works off the top of my head. I don't know what structures are involved in echolocation. But it can it can start with something very simple and then become more complex over time. And there's no reason to think that that should evolve once. It can evolve multiple times because it is a useful adaptation. So what we see is what? They keep contradicting themselves every two seconds, right? Okay, is that it? No, 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 that's not it. We're <laughs> not done, okay? Let's move on. They got something that we call the, 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 the cichlid fish. Cichlid fish, is, it's a very interesting example. Why? Because it's not just two animals that look alike that you can explain, oh, no, no, just similar environments. No, no. It's one fish, one animal that produces different species that are exactly identical to the same type of fish. It it's one fish, it's one animal that produces many species. What are you saying? It's one species that produces many species? Like, what are you even saying? It, it produces many forms, some of which are superficially similar. What are you saying? In a different lake, in a different environment. 
So two minutes ago, you're telling to me there's something called convergent evolution that can explain two animals that look similar and this and that. Okay, what about now one producing different fishes in different environments, in different lakes that are almost identical? How can you explain that? How can you explain that by blind natural selection and blind processes that you claim are not directed and they happen by themselves because of evolution, the animals try to survive, therefore it happens. So okay, what features do you want us to explain? Name an anatomical feature. Name something that is so unbelievable that it can't be reproduced. I see a bunch of fish, right? So you're talking about fish that are superficially that superficially resemble one another. Uh, shocking, right? If fish in different environments, they have similar features. W w like, name a feature in two separate species that you find to be absolutely impossible to accept uh, uh, arising twice by chance. Name one. You're not doing it. You're just showing a picture of fish. What about the fish? Tell us. How can you explain this happening to us? What do they say? A new name, parallel evolution. Now the answer to that question is, is that some of these fishes, there is something new called parallel evolution and when parallel evolution happens, this takes place. But actually, the interesting thing that they said is that in that research, they said to you, it's not just random blind natural selection. It is a guided one. That research I'm putting for you here, in the, in the Nature magazine, they will say to you, developmental bias and natural selection work together rather than selection being free to transver uh, transverse over uh, any physical possibility. It is guided along specific routes. My question is guided by who? <laughs> who's, who's guided this natural cell? They, they just put a beauty. What do you mean guided by who? Guided by evolutionary principle, guided by natural selection. What are you asking? Uh, that's not what that means. A, a fancy name, parallel evolution. And they, t they say to you that it has to be guided and they don't give you an explanation. Who, who's guiding it? Who's guiding that fish to produce the same exact uh, species or almost identical to the same other fish that in a completely different location that you claim to us it is based on your environment, you have the, the evolution taking place? Come on, what, what are you guys saying? You know, I'm more clear. I don't know how these people, Leanne, subhanAllah, I don't know how these people, they, they have, they can come with a straight face and say to you evolution is facts. I seriously don't know, okay? okay. Yeah, I have the same. Uh, I have the same impression of you. Okay, moving on. They have something called random mutations. What they claim is that mutations are random. This is a whole list here of research showing you how mutations are not random. Let's let's go through some some of them, right? Let's go through some of them. Them telling you themselves, not by people who are creationists who believe in evolution. Yeah, this research is in nature. Yeah, it's not it's not by people who believe evolution is already true. Okay. Let's go to showing you some of the, how these mutations that they claim to be random are nowhere near being random. Okay, if you open this, okay, let me share my screen. Give you one example. Okay, research here published by Nature, okay. 791 citations, you can go into it. It talks to you about the origins of mutations and how they're not uh, uh, random, how they're not, Random mutations, okay? That's one example. Let me show you. Holy hell. You pulled up the link for four seconds. Again, you didn't even click the link to accept cookies so we can see half of the abstract, let alone a quarter. The origin of mute, what is it? What is the paper about? What is the paper about? You have no, you didn't read it. You picked something that you think substantiates the bullshit you're spewing and you didn't even show anyone a single word about it. Astounding. Do another example. Uh, let me open this one, sorry. Okay. Uh, let me present my screen again. Okay. Okay, new study. New study, yeah? It's 2000 what? 2022. Okay, by Harry Baker. Okay, 2022. New study proves first, uh, the claim first, but we're going to prove that now that it's not. I just showed you a research that is before it, that, like showing opposite to that. First evidence of non random mutations in DNA. It's not the first, but this is the, the lie that they will bring for you. It's, this is, this is re just recent research, yeah, last year, literally, right? <laughs> we're just in, in February, okay? Uh, what else? Let me show you. Just the. 
the, you don't even have to look any further than how like the the percentage of the links that he actually shows and how rapidly he moves on from them. He has no clue what they say. Non-random mutations. What are they? What are you? T I mean, you don't even know what mutations are in general. I don't think you know what DNA is. I don't think you know anything about genetics whatsoever. I think you have below a ninth grade understanding of genetics. What are non-random mutations? What are you even talking about? What is a mutation? So obviously, I don't know too much about it. But what are we talking? We're ta presumably it's some kind of epigenetic. Uh, feature right maybe a gene is guarded because it's coordinated to a histone or something like that right there's something that that statistically preferentially uh, a certain region of the genome is is more predisposed towards mutation than another something like that it doesn't mean that random mutation isn't a thing you're not even like what does it say that wasn't even primary scientific literature and you're still not looking at any of it you won't even read a single sentence from it because you have no ability to talk about it. You don't know what mutations are. You don't know what DNA is. It's just ridiculous. Show you this. Uh, by the way, the same research that I just showed you, which is the research of the fish, cichlid fish, in that same research, they will say to you that here, I put it here, variation is not random. That they will claim to you that it's random. I already told you it's guided. So it's not random mutation. It's not blind natural selection. All of it is guided. It's not random. Okay, let's see how. Explain how. Explain the difference, right? Mechanistically, what are you talking about? Let's hear it. Here, let's watch this video of Dennis Noble. Who, who, who knows what Dennis Noble is? Can, do you know who Dennis Noble is, Brother Sabo? Okay. You know, can you tell us uh, just a brief? If yeah. We can even. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm just going to briefly describe him. But just before that, Sorry, I keep muting myself, but I don't want to, you know, because then okay. someone, yeah. So, okay, with, with, okay. With, with, yeah, with Dennis Noble, um, before I introduce him, I just wanted to say that um, I actually sent him a email um, because he's really into music and this type of thing. So I said to him that, you know, he, he, here is something for you to listen to. And it's actually the call to prayer. It was actually the, the a that, beautiful... That, that a beautiful wow. az uh, azan that um, uh, someone did and he was so moved by it right so you know some of these academics they're so dr they're so much into dry boring stuff that sometimes you have to just give them you don't even have to give them like deep dawah i just gave him yes. this thing and he listened to it so anyway yes. about dennis noble dennis noble is an i'm sorry i can't let that slide this is a ridiculous attempt to like dehumanize uh, people who actually understand science, they're so dry. They have no spirit. They have no heart. They don't like art. They don't understand art. Uh, many scientists understand art perfectly well. I myself am an artist. Also, I find the call, the call to prayer uh, very moving. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It doesn't mean anything that you morons believe is true. Uh, the, uh, there's no correlation between scientific thinking and an inability to appreciate art you're just trying to dehumanize the people who know that you're wrong anti-darwinian evolutionist okay now this is hard for people to believe like what on earth is an anti-darwinian evolutionist he's basically someone that doesn't accept the modern synthesis he doesn't accept this idea of neo-darwinism and its many assumptions he's actually said neo-darwinism in terms of most of his assumptions have has actually failed and he is a okay, neo Darwinism is a term that was coined in the 1920s. He actually, I will give him credit for saying the term modern synthesis. I heard him say that. So, but the thing is that he doesn't like, he's just throwing out terms that he's heard, right? Modern synthesis, neo Darwinism, like he just kind of uses them interchangeably, not knowing that they're like 70 years apart in terms of how biology operates uh and and by the way dennis noble is a complete clown so we'll see how much they talk about him a professor at oxford university he's challenged richard dawkins to a debate which he didn't actually accept dennis noble um from my understanding and this is uh, on the public record as well he's not a christian he's not a muslim he doesn't actually believe in any religion uh, yet he is somebody that is well respected and as you pointed out He's against this idea that random mutations, along with selection, can create the, bio di the biodiversity that we actually have. Uh, he considers the mechanism to be insufficient 
and therefore he's pushing out the ideas like like the ones that you were just speaking of mm-hmm. um, by actually challenging the modern synthesis mm-hmm. and i want to say one thing one thing very important he still believes in evolution that's why i want people to 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 keep in mind we're not bringing yeah. you again i said to you i'm not going to bring you creationists yeah so i can come and say to you this guy is a creationist yeah? that's a well respected academic as he said at oxford university taught, taught him and made everything he invented he invented even certain things right certain uh, i don't even have them now if you go if you just google his name you'll see he's inventing new things even that people are using mathematical formats and this and that you can go into into the the the, the research that he's done and all the imp- yeah james tour makes nano cars that doesn't mean he understands anything about origin of life research sorry inventions that he made but let's listen yep. to what he says yeah let's listen listen to what he says okay let me share my screen and it's a very very quick and short and beautiful as they say video yeah okay i want everyone to confirm if the voice uh, you can hear the voice okay uh, okay, so this is what this is a conference a conference that happened. In, it's an international conf- uh, conference that happened in China. Yeah, and he was speaking in that international con- uh, conference. It happened two th- in two uh, thousand twelve. Okay, uh, let's just make sure that everyone it is, is here. Difficult if not in- Okay, can people hear? I want to see is the people in the chat. If you can hear, I think they can hear, isn't it? Can everyone should hear? Able, they should be able to. Yeah. Okay, let, let's play the video then. Okay, let's see what he says. It is difficult, if not impossible, to find a genome change operator that is truly random in its action within the DNA of a cell. All careful studies of mutagenesis find statistically significant non-random patterns of change. So, Okay, he says what? All research. This is not a guy that is going to come out and say something that people are going to allow him to say, yeah? I, I hope you're able to keep that in mind. He's saying all research. Yeah, put that in your mind very well. Yeah, they all have patterns. Just the the sheer amount of giggling is a mask for how little he understands what this guy's saying. And as much of a clown as Dennis Noble is, he doesn't deny evolution. These guys are referencing this guy to in order to pretend that evolution isn't real, whereas he doesn't even propose that. Right, so you, they don't know what non-random mutation is, right? Obviously, there are elements of that are completely random, right? When you have re, uh, when you have uh, errors in DNA replication, it is completely random. Where there are bases where substitutions occur, things like that, uh, that is completely random. Where you when you have exogenous mutagens, when you have radioactive nuclides within the body of an organism that emit high energy particles it is completely random where those particles strike in a genome and cause a mutation right those are so there there are other uh aspects in terms of epigenetics or whatever that shield certain parts of the genome perhaps that make it not completely random in terms of where those mutations manifest because something may be shielded or whatever the case may be That does nothing whatsoever to invalidate evolution as a concept. Not even this guy, Noble, is is pretending that. But this is what creationists do. Like, they'll take scientists and they'll twist what they say in order to try to invalidate science. Like, it's bananas. There's no such thing as random mutations. If an idiot comes to you, assists to you, there's random mutation. They just show him that video, yeah? So there's no such thing as random mutations. Okay, let's listen to what he says. Yeah, okay. So my first conclusion is this. Not only is mutation not random, that was one of the essential assumptions of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, uh, but proteins, at least some of them, did not evolve via gradual accumulation of mutations. Okay, so he refutes what? He refutes gradual accumulation when it comes to proteins, and he refutes any idea called random mutations in in the genes. Yep. So there is no such thing. I guess that's gospel, right? Let's listen to this one guy who says the thing that we like, and let's ignore hundreds of thousands of biologists who discredit everything we say. As random mutation, and as I said to you, any idiot comes to you and says to you there's random mutations, he's an idiot who did not study the research. And I put for you already links here. Yeah, you don't believe me? I just put you four four links. A couple of them are from uh, one of them is from Life Science. A couple of them from Nature. These are all accepted scientific magazines. All of them are of people who support evolution. Okay. And what do they say? I guess we'll never know because you won't click on them. It's not from uh, creations. Okay. Now the question is that directed by you. 
Would they ever say directed by God? That's an impossibility in the, in the scientific field. So what do they say? It's actually directed by cells. In the first research I showed to you here, that I said to you by nature, the first one, they claim it's actually the cells are smart and intelligent. And at least that's how, you know, prior to their crea creation, they already had these codes of how, of how to be organized. And, and they, uh, they started functioning on them after their creation. What an idiotic thing to say. Yeah, nobody says that. You said it because you don't have any clue what they're actually talking about. Some other things say to you, it's microbes, actually. There is, uh, and they've invented a new term called microbial intelligence. You know what? This the word is microbial. Microbial intelligence. Microbes are intelligence and they know how to have these mutations. These mutations happen because microbes are smart. Another research says to you, oh, by nature, it's bacteria. Bacteria is intelligent and we've got intelligent bacteria and that's how it's guided. Why, why do you compile these links when you, n I mean, it's abundantly clear that you have no idea what they say, but you don't even, I mean, you're, you have so clearly no clue what they say that you, you're too afraid to even click on them because if anything shows up about what it actually says, it will become even more clear that you have no clue what these sources are saying. Like, what is the purpose of compiling these? It's the facade of diligence. I already said this. The, you you are relying on the facade of diligence. That's what this is. What kind of who who buys these things? Who literally listens to this nonsense and says the evolution is true? Who listens to this rubbish and says the evolution is true? Okay. Anyone who knows what they're talking about. Let's move on from that. Yeah. Let's move into the genes now. Yeah. Let's go to the pool of the genes. We already spoke about random mutations and how it doesn't exist. Let's go a little bit to some research talking about genes and, and genetic similarities. This research I put here, right, which is the, by the National Library of, of Medicine, the, of Medicine, the Gov, right? Well uh, accepted. There is no doubt about it. Everyone hears about it. 98.8% uh, identical between human and chimpanzees. Everyone hears this research, right or wrong? If you speak to anyone in, in the basic, even laymen, if you go to them and you say to them that they're 99 or 98, they'll all say to you, yeah, yeah, they're 98 or 99 percent identical. The question is now, are humans are chimp and chimpanzees actually 98.8 percent identical? Is that claim true? Now, how do we understand yeah. this? By going into the methodology that these people use to come up with this conclusion of 98.8, identical now and i want people to pay a close attention can, with me yes can i can i just say something just before we get into that i just want everybody watching to just be aware of something uh which is super important muhammad's gonna go over the reasons why the comparison of 98 percent is misleading and it's lying by omission and this is well known and established however i want to give a counterfactual what if it's not 98.8%? What if it's 100%, right? Or 99.999% and they're not wrong. Similarities in of themselves. What are you talking about? What if it's 100% similar? If it was 100% identical, we'd be identical species. What are you talking about? Like disparate forms can't be 100% genetically. Not even, not even human siblings are 100% genetically identical. What are you talking about? Do not prove anything. You need the transformation being done by a mechanism and you need the origination prob probability being close to zero. Without these two things, even if the similarity was even closer than 98.8%, it would make no difference to the claim between human chimp ancestry being true or it actually being false because you need the background information to do that. So just as a, the upshot of what I'm saying is similarities simply mean similarities. They don't. What, what, what are you, the background information, like this is gibberish. I don't even know what to say. Uh, genetic similarity is evidence of ancestry. That's how paternity tests work, right? You figure out paternity based on genetic similarity. Uh, and that, that goes on and on and on generations in the past. What are you talking about? Mean anything else unless you have background assumptions. Absolutely. And as a simple example I made to that guy, you know, all iPhones look the same. They're from the same manufacturer. That's, yeah. that's a, you know, this is just because two things are identical does, does not change this idea that, you know what, uh, we don't want to go into, into specific details. 
we don't want to go into we don't want to go into the ridiculous metaphor that I use the the ridiculous example that I use that that is insane and and doesn't prove anything. We don't want to go into that. I don't want to keep talking about that. iPhones, a thing that we invented, uh, has somehow something to do with biological evolution. Yes, let's go yeah. to, to the genes now. Let's talk about the genes. Okay, so in that research, why is that research? highly problematic or sorry why is that conclusion highly problematic i'm going to go into into details now first you can open a book it's called bioinformatics and functional genomics this is what is taught in universities right i'm not teaching i'm not bringing you my own thing this is what is taught in universities if you go to the third edition if you go to the chapter third chapter introduction someone says i'm making this up i'm giving you the reference okay they say that two genes or proteins are homologous if they evolved from a common ancestor so they say that they are homologous if we accept the assumption that they evolved from a common ancestor. That's what the book is saying. Okay. Now, when you go un under the same book, there's a section called scoring metrics. The scoring metrics. The scoring metrics that they use in those studies. They say most database searching methods, such as BLAST, BLAT, BLAST, HMMMER, there's many differences, depend in some form on the uh, in, in some form on the evolutionary insight of the day of model. So they're saying to you the systems that they're using to look for those similarities already assumes the evolution is true already assumes you and the chimpanzee are from common uh, ancestors already assumes that you're both your genes are homologous before doing the search it already assumes so it moves from humans and chimpanzees are homologous if we consider them from a common ancestor to humans and chimpanzees are homologous therefore they are from a common ancestor it doesn't say anything like that. <laughs> For uh, we, we evolution is true. It is objectively true. We observe evolution happening, and so we understand how genomes evolve over time. And so the this is the model with within which we compare. We do genomic analysis. And so, uh, but I think the funniest part of all is that you read this and you said most database searching methods such as BLAST and HMMER depend in some form on the evolutionary insights of the Dayhoff model. Uh, I don't know what any of those are, so you definitely don't. Uh, you have no clue what any of that means. Uh, I mean, you don't even know what DNA is, if we're being honest. So it, it's very funny to me how you're acting as though you understand how what that methodology is, but you're trying to extrapolate that into some kind of assumption or circular reason. No, there's no assumption. We, we understand... Uh, we understand DNA, we understand genomics, we understand evolutionary principles, we observe how, genome, how genomes observe, uh, uh, evolve over time, and so that is what we use in genomic analysis. There's no assumption being made about common ancestry, we just understand how DNA works. That's how we do this. See, the same idea of the circle, circle reasons that I displayed earlier when it comes to the vestigial or the same type of nonsensical things. This is a bit confusing, but I will explain it when I go into, into the research. I'll give an example. Point is, it's no longer an assumption, or sorry, it's evidence. They already assume that it is the case before they do the, the research. Rather than doing the research to come to the conclusion that it is true or not, they already assume it's true, and they use the methods that assumes it's true to, this, to prove what they already believe. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. So in this study, why was it problematic? First, they used 3 million genes out of 3 billion. So literally, one out of 1000 genetic codes only in that research now within i'm sorry there's just so there's just so much there <laughs> there's just, like you, if you could choose one sentence to demonstrate that he has no clue what he's talking about he said three million genes out of three billion genes i'm pretty sure that's what he said there's no organism that has millions or billions of genes uh i that means that he's talking about base pairs what was the other thing? I'm sorry, go back one second. What did you say? First, they used 3 million genes out of 3 billion. So literally one out of 1,000 genetic codes only in that research. One out of 1,000 genetic codes. <laughs> what are you talking about? 1,000 genetic codes? What are, what, what are genetic codes? Plural. What do you... Oh my God, you don't know what DNA is. You don't know what DNA is. It's unbelievable. Now, within one out of 1,000 in that research that, that they use, they ignored 28% differences and 7% differences between humans and, some, and chimpanzees, which is actually 35%. So if we were to take that 35%, it's why 65% similarities now already. And 
given the fact that we only taking three percent. Uh, sorry, three million for out of three billion of the genetic codes. So first they ignore three million out of the genetic codes. <laughs> uh, I don't know what these numbers are. You're pulling them out of your ass. They're not from any particular study. Uh, humans and chimps are 98.8% identical. These numbers are meaningless. You have no idea what you're talking about. The majority of the genes, number one. Number two, they're excluding that which they don't like, which is 28% and seven differences. And they say in the same study, why they excluded it? They say, we excluded it because there's no similarities. Oh, you don't say, <laughs> you know? So that, so that which is not similar, you ignore. And you bring that which is similar and you claim that there's identity. Wait, wait, what are you uh, uh, excluding? What the hell are you talking about? These are genomic. These are, th this is comparative genomics. We're taking the entire genome of a species and the entire genome of another species and assessing the percentage similarity. Uh, there's nothing excluded. It's the entire genome of one species and the entire genome of another species. All of the genetic information compared with all of the genetic information. There's nothing excluded. What are you talking about? Technicality, 98.8. And now they do this beautiful, uh, very beautiful, nice things that they call deletion, substitu substitution and insertion. And in every, uh, it is between 1 to 65 codes in the sequence. Okay, so, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. He, he, he said they, they do... They do this thing, deletion, sub what do you talk, deletion, substitution, and insertion, these are types of genetic, uh, uh, these, these are types of mutations that occur in nature. Deletion, substitution, insertion, right? Deletion, uh, a base pair is deleted. Substitution, you uh, change a particular base pair. Insertion, a base pair is inserted. So deletion, insertion change the reading frame. Substitution is just changing a particular base pair. This is, this is what happens in nature. He said they do. He said they do. I don't know. Uh, that's bizarre. That they will do deletion, substitution, and insertion in. And I will explain what deletion, and substitution, and insertion in. We're going to go into that. Okay. I, I, I bet you won't. Okay. And I want to say something. I want to make a very important point. Here the research that I put in, in uh, Scientific American. If you just search hidden tre uh, treasures in, in junk DNA, right? They used to have this stupid belief that there's something called junk DNA and it's useless and all of that. And Richard Dawkins and these people were talking about it. And today we know this is nonsense. And all types of genes are, are useful and important for the human being. Okay? Now they... All types of genes are... Of course genes are useful. They're protein coding, you nitwit. It, junk DNA is non-protein coding. We're talking about parts of the DNA that are not genes. First of all, and I'm sorry, all <laughs> all creationists do this. It's this thing where, like, where, what percentage of the genome are genes? It's like 1%. I forget the exact number. It's like 1% something. But it, it's such a small amount is actual genes. The vast majority of it is, is not genes. And so, yes, it's true. Over time, we figured out that certain percentages of, of, of the DNA that are not within a gene serve a function in terms of uh, regulation of gene expression and these other kinds of things. That doesn't mean that there's no junk DNA. There's tons of junk DNA. Some of what was previously dubbed junk DNA has been found to serve a particular purpose as a promoter or whatever, you know, all of these other things. There's other, there's parts of DNA that are not genes that serve a purpose in, in gene expression. That doesn't mean that there's not junk DNA. There's tons of junk DNA, which of course makes perfect sense in the context of evolution because you have this very, very, very long genome, many different chromosomes, lots of base pairs within which certain uh, protein coding regions evolve by chance, right? That makes absolutely no sense in design. Why would design do that? Why would design have 1% of the genome be coding for proteins? What is the purpose of all this junk DNA? But they always do this. They take this thing where, they're, oh, there's some of the junk DNA serves a purpose. Therefore, junk DNA is not a thing. It's, it is a thing. Most of the, most of the genome is junk. In, in that it doesn't serve any function, but let's continue. Because he already, by the way, he already changed the subject from whatever he was talking about with deletions and things like that. Important thing is this, is that changing one gene, one genetic code in certain situations can be... 
changing one gene, changing one genetic code. How, like, what, how many sentences can you utter to demonstrate that you have no clue what you're talking about? Fatal. You can die. You cannot exist as a human being. Right? Now, the point is they're claiming thousands, if not millions, of changes in, the, in these studies, but they will do the ignore them. They do insertion, deletion, substitution. They ignore all of these different things, right? And they substitute, literally, they change, they delete certain uh, uh, genetic codes. They delete them. Even okay. The, uh, uh, um wow uh so so he's pretending that the people who are who are performing comparative genomic analysis are manipulating the data and changing base pairs to to be whatever they want them to be like what like what are you talking like they do substitute like what are you talking about what are you talking about? We're, we we sequence a genome, we sequence a genome, and we compare them. What do you mean do substitute? What are you talking about? Oh my God, like this is like a baffling level of cluelessness that I can barely wrap my head around. No, as I said to you, one of them can be fatal. They delete them in order for them to push this narrative that it's actually nice. They delete, they don't, they delete what? What are you talking about? Nobody is deleting anything. We, we <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm surmising what's happening is that when you do genomic analysis and you do it in an, in, in an ancestral context and you're looking at a lineage, you can identify places historically where evolution has occurred, where deletions, substitutions, or insertions have occurred to cause changes in the genome, and we're acknowledging where that happened naturally, and this bozo is thinking that we're looking at genomes and we're we're fabricating data and we're going, oh, I want this genome to look like something else, so I'm just gonna change the data. Like, that's what this moron thinks that biologists are doing. I, uh, I'm i pretty sure that's what he's trying to say. 98.8% identical, okay? So this is the nonsense that they do to come up to this conclusion, 98.8. Is that it? No, right? What they do, what they did in that study, they, they ignored all the insertion and deletion that they did. And they only left. They didn't do, they didn't do insert. Oh my God. <sighs> These are kinds of mutations. Holy hell. The substitution. So they ignored all the percentages that they did insertion and deletion in them. They completely ignored them. And they only put what they did substitution. So what do you mean by subs substitution and insertion and deletion? Let me explain. Yes, please explain. Please explain how you don't understand what those words mean. Why are we saying that they use methods that already assume evolution? So look here, if you can see in the, in the picture that I have, the image that I have. First, we have the chimp. So let's assume these genes that I have on the top are the genes of the chimp. These genes? These genes? You mean like a dozen base pairs are, are multiple genes? Is that what you're pretending? Okay. And let's look down here. We have the human. So the genes between the chimp, the chimp and the human are completely different. Can you see, brother? It starts with C, and then it's, it's even longer, right? As I said to you. So it starts with C. This one starts with T. With T. It doesn't start with C. This one ends with G, this one ends with A. We can go on, there's many differences between the two. So what they, what they do, when they use these methods that already assume evolution, they assume that there is a common ancestor. And then they add this type of genes in the middle that they brought from their pocket, right? That has what, what genes in the middle? <laughs> this guy thinks that a, a singular base pair is a gene. Like, I can't... This is like blowing my mind how dumb this guy is. I, I, uh, this is, so, he, like, oh my God, you're so much dumber than I thought any creationist could be. Uh, I need to hear more of this. That has no evidence for it. And they assume that this is a common ancestor between the human and the ship. Yeah. So they bring. What common ancestor? You're not even introducing a third organism. You're, you're, you're the, first of all, you're completely fumbling. You're completely fumbling the concept of comparative genomics, and then you're introducing a third species. What are you talk? What common ancestor? What is the common ancestor? What are you saying? Additional data that there is no evidence for. And what they do now is that they use that as evidence to align between the chimp and the human and the human. So if they found extra genes that I said to you, 
they can either do deletion. So they'll completely remove the C and the A. If they find there's a difference between the C and the T, they will do what we call substitution. They will change the T into a C or the C into a T. And they will claim that there is a, sim a similarity there. Or... Okay, I mean, I, there's just... I mean, this is like uh, what I said. <laughs> there's just no way around it. The guy th doesn't know what substitution, insertion, and deletion mean. He doesn't know what those words mean. And he's pretending that what they mean is that researchers doing comparative genomics fabricate data. Like when he says substitution... What he thinks that means is that a researcher goes, well, mm, in order to in order to support the dogma, the atheistic evolution dogma, in order for my research to serve my ideological purpose, I need to fabricate this data. So I'm going to do substitution. I'm like, that's straight up what this guy is saying. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that's what this guy is pretending that biologists do. I just like, this is, I've never, <laughs> oh my God. Like, I'm so used to Discovery Institute, where, like, where it's like the most elevated version of dumb creationist lies. Like, they would never say anything this stupid. So it's like a little bit shocking to like readjust to somebody saying something this mind-numbingly stupid. Or they would do insertion. If there is more down and there is less in the top, let's add one more gene on the top. Oh. And let's add one other gene in the end. So we can have the same identical uh, process. So what did they do? They do this insertion, deletion, and substitution. And this is the problem. They've already assumed that we have evolved from the same uh, uh, common ancestor. That's why they add this selection of genes in the middle. And that's why they yeah. use it as, as, a, as a stick to combine or to explain the differences that are the, between us and them. And as I said to you, if you remove one gene in certain cases, you can die. So they, they're removing thousands and millions of genes, depending on how big the study is. So there's no organism that has millions of genes. There's no, they're removing millions of genes. Like <laughs> the guy thinks the guy doesn't know the difference between a base pair and a gene. That's how dumb this guy is. So they're not only doing all of this nonsense to come up to this conclusion, but they're ignoring all the other studies that says otherwise. So when you come to anyone, they'll say it's 98.8. .8. Here, same magazines. PNAS, these are world-renowned magazines, okay? 98%, the difference is actually 90, uh, 96%. Actually, it's 95%. No, actually, it's 77%. Actually, it's 70%. The question is, why are they all different? The answer is simple. They're all using different methods. One is using BLAST, one is using BLAST, one is using HHMER, one is doing more insertion than the other, one is using more deletion than the other. If we you have no clue what any of that means, you have no clue what any of these papers say, you're posting link you're you're pasting links and random numbers you have no clue what any of that says if we were actually 98 percent, this is what science is science is brother support right it is a, a experiment repeatability and falsification right if we were actually 98.8 every study that is done will come with the conclusion that we're 98.8 this is how science work and then we will say that actually this is a scientific reality that we are 98.8 but because of this nonsense that they're doing, and because of all of these different methods, of the, the games that, the, that they're playing, they're coming up with different conclusions. They're ignoring any other research that would say less. And, and they're doing all of these games of insertion, deletion, substitution. And there's many other terms. I just brought three because I don't want to bore you with the amount of nonsense that they do when they try to pick the genes that look like each other. And the gene There's no nonsense whatsoever. You just don't know what DNA is. You don't know what genomic analysis is. You're pretending that all of the biologists in the entire world are idiots and that you, a science illiterate sh toddler, no better than the entire scientific community. It's astounding. Is that do not look like each other? Okay, you want to say something before I move on? No, no. Uh, you, you know the uh, the point that you're raising here. I think because some people 
they'll look at these particular pictures, they'll look at the insertions and the deletions and the different numbers you're going over and they'll get confused. But I think a way to similar, uh, a way to summarize it is mm -hmm. they are subjective in how they come to their conclusions. They can pick and choose what they want and because of that, that's why you have all these discrepancy. And even if... There's no discrepancies, there's nothing subjective about it. You're taking a genome and another genome and comparing them. It's pure math, right? Here are two, disp here are two genomes. What percentage of them are identical? What percentage of identicality is there? It's pure math. There's nothing subjective. You just don't understand their methodology, obviously. I mean, if I'm being honest, I don't know the precise methodology that they used to do it. Uh, but you guys don't even know what DNA is. So what are you talking about? These discrepancies so were not just yep. pick and, and, and choose, they change. Yes, Substitution, yes. they completely change the, the genetic makeup. And so okay, this is, I mean, look, I, the, you're, you can't make it any more clear that this is what you're doing. They don't change anything. They sequence a genome, they sequence a genome, and they compare them. They don't change anything. You're... Oh my God! The, like <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around how dumb you are. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Because that's very yeah, important. Yeah. It's not just picking and choosing. That's different. Yeah, it's 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 super important. And and what we have to realize about whenever it comes to any a comparison between, um, you know, uh, the human genome and the chimpanzee genome, the scientist who's studying the human genome and the chimpanzee genome and they're doing the studies, take the names of each one of these scientists who are putting together these papers and interview them before, let's just say hypothetically, before they did the experiments and ask them, do you believe in human chimpanzee history? Every single one of them will say yes. So the thing is, it's a foregone conclusion. Wow, biologists understand biology. Shocking. Uh, let's ask physicists if they believe in gravity or let's ask chemists if they believe in atoms. Oh my gosh, all of the chemists believe in atoms. It's dogma. <laughs> they already believe it. And it's just about fitting the data to make it appear that the the, the similarity is less or more than they previously thought. So Absolutely. no one's no one's and this is this is super important, brothers and sisters. Nobody's coming to the evidence from a perspectiveless perspective. They already have it clear in their head that universal common ancestry is true. And therefore, they are not objectively coming to this data. They are simply uh, coming to it with their uh, what was known as theory ladenness in philosophy of science. And that's why these conclusions are absurd. They're, they're simply that's, absurd. That's what they're taught in universities, Brother Sabo. Yeah. They're already taught as students. It is, that's what I'm saying. Why? You have no idea what university students are taught. You have no clue what goes on. If you took a bio 101 course at any university and actually like studied and passed the class, you wouldn't be spew. I mean, you don't even know what DNA is. What are you guys talking about? Am I building up with all of that? Because they already told this is a reality, this is a fact. So the, whatever method they use, that's why I opened their own textbooks and what they teach in their own universities, is they already use these methods. If you open this research I showed you, they use blat. If you open a science research with the same exact percentage, but different types of genes, they apply the same method, but they're also using BLAST. Again, they're using all of these different methods. Why are you pretending to know what BLAST means? Like, it's ridiculous. You've no clue what that means. They already assume the truth of evolution, and they add all of these different data. Like, for example, to simplify it very simply to, to any layman, if I say Muhammad ate camel meat, what they would do is that because they want these two statements to be identical, Muhammad ate camel meat, camel ate Muhammad meat. They want these two statements to be identical. So what they're going to do is they're going to change camel with Muhammad in the position, and they're going to do alt substitution, and they will change the positions, or they will do a deletion of Muhammad. They will put camel in there, and do a deletion of the other camel, and they put Muhammad in there to come up with the same conclusion. This is the dumbest analogy of all time. I mean... Like, first of all, we're st he's still clinging to this thing that they're changing things. They're not changing anything. But second of all, genes don't have syntax. Right? The, 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 the genetic code is not the English language. What are you talking about?
even though these two statements are completely contradictory. Right? Muhammad A. Kawli and Kawli A. Bahawli is completely opposite, right? But they will do with these methods. Now, to simplify, very simple for the people, right? Rather than doing all of this, they, are, they will do substitution, insertion, deletion, and they will... They do not do any of that. Say to you, look, it is 100% identical now. This is actually 99% identical. By this method, I can make anything 100% identical. Literally. I can make any gene between any human and anything is, is 100%. Identical. That's why you have this banana and human being 50% uh, similarities because of the methods that they use. It's no, it's because the genomes are 50% similar. Right? That's how my, like, I know that sounds crazy because a banana is nothing like, well, it's not a banana, it's a banana plant. A banana plant and a human, whatever percentage similarity, up around 50%. Look at the metabolic pathways. Right, we're talking about protein coding regions of the genome. What are what are the proteins that all biological life have in common, even plant life compared with animal life? We're still talking about metabolic pathways, right? What 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 is in there? What is in every plant cell that's also in every animal cell? Obviously, it's tremendous disparate, right? There's a lot of different stuff. But there's some similarities. He's just scoffing at it because, I mean, come on. We're going to have a conversation with this guy about metabolism and metabolic pathways. He doesn't know what a protein is. He doesn't know any of this stuff. It just yeah. depends on which method that they use to come into similarities between these two two different things. And you can say any amount that you want to say. Uh, 96, 95, 77, 70. Whatever you like, you can say. No, you do the comparative genomic analysis and you get a number and that's the result of the study. You can't say whatever you want. You can say whatever you want because you're a lying charlatan apologist. That's not what scientists do. They do, they perform experiments and they get data and they report their data. Yeah, and an additional point that I want everybody to just keep in mind is that before Darwin, there was Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish scientist who put together taxonomy the way that we have it in terms of all these different organisms being uh, put together in these categories. And he put humans and chimpanzees together because of their similarities in an anatomy. But he didn't believe they had a common ancestor. So it's it's pretty bloody obvious that things are similar. But that doesn't mean they have a common ancestor. And the other thing to keep in mind... Yeah, but it does. It does. Linnaeus was in the 18th century. So he didn't have the he didn't have the standpoint that we have today of understanding uh, understanding genetics. All right. So that's how obvious it is how, how nested hierarchies work and how and how phylogeny works. He didn't have the ability, right? This is we're talking Linnaeus predates literally uh he he predates Gregor Mendel. He he predates the entire field of genetics. How could he have any ability to understand the 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 concept of common ancestry, right? How could he possibly know that? Right. Historically, he's at a disadvantage. So he had this ability to morphologically place organisms in these nested hierarchies, but he didn't understand how the, how they could possibly be related. Luckily, we live in the 21st century, so we don't have to rely on the data that Linnaeus had at hand. We have current modern science. So but this is what you guys do. You go like, oh, Newton did this or Linnaeus did this. It's like. Yeah, we live in it's this is 2024, you guys. It's not 1740. So catch up a little bit. And this is something that atheists they pull out as if it's some sort of miracle. They say, well, if humans and chimpanzees are not related, why are their genomes similar? And the answer to that is why wouldn't their genomes be similar? Because they are anatomically similar. But they, but we are related. What do you mean? Why wouldn't they be related? We, we are related. I mean, look again. This is you're denying the concept that genetic similarity uh, indicates ancestry, right? This you're denying the validity of paternity tests, right? If if you like and and like if you want to deny the validity of a paternity test. I guess you could do that because you're slippery creationists and you, there's no end to what you would deny. But if you if you can determine who the father of a child is by genetic similarity, why can't you determine the father's father? 
and the father's father's father, and the father's father's father, father. I don't know how many fathers I said. Uh, there, like, <laughs> there. Where is the where is the line upon uh, after which this idea of of uh, of of genomic comparison no longer indicating common ancestry? Where is that line drawn? Because to people who actually understand biology, there's no line, right? This continues many generations into the past and through different species and 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 genera and families and etc. We would expect the genome to be Absolutely. similar. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is the same. Uh, the, what I was saying before about the vestigial organs, right? It is the, already the assumption that evolution is true. And the organ can be only useful if it is for, if it is for survival and reproduction. But Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا جَمَالٌ حِينَ تُرِحُونَ وَتُسْرِحُونَ وَحِينَ تَسْرَحُونَ Allah says in these animals you have beauty. Allah, I can accept with you that they're completely useless for survival and reproduction. And still there's a purpose. Purpose is, a purpose is beauty. Allah created it in that way for, for, for the beauty, for them to look more beautiful, for them to look more amazing. So even if I were to steal man their argument and accept that they're not useful for survival and reproduction, yeah. we can find an alternative explanation, right? Yeah. And, and also, I just wanted to add... I'm sorry, but what a vapid, ex what a vapid explanation is that? It's just like your take a beauty be okay name me a beautiful tree i mean this is so unbelievably subjective like you're just if something doesn't serve an actual function towards survival you have a catch all you have a catch all saying beauty okay give there <laughs> i mean there's it's very clear why you don't actually give any concrete example of that a, a, a beautiful point related to what you said because what you said is is absolutely beautiful when it comes down to the points that they're making they cross over from biology into theology okay i'm gonna come to so, that i'm okay. gonna come to okay, that good, come. Good, no good. as i said to you i've prepared i prepared mashallah uh, no you did I use meal for them. You know? Mashallah. They're satisfied I, in that. And I, I, I need to, I need to get this presentation. This, uh, this is beautiful. I'm I'll gonna send try it to you, inshallah. I'll send inshallah, it to you. I'll send it to you. So you cannot read any of the links yourself. Inshallah, I'll send it to you. As I say, it's a quick one. I could have gotten more detail, but I don't want to yeah. bore the people. You know, I don't want to. Yeah, bore the but people. you know, you know, these presentations, Muhammad, they're very important because whenever we're talking to atheists, we need to have them ready. We need to have these Absolutely. references ready. We need Absolutely, to have these that's why ready. I have them ready. Yeah. Well, you're really stumping us with these links, uh, these lists of links that you didn't read and you don't know what they say. Yeah. I have them ready. The links, whatever, whenever they come to you, they claim that, uh, that there is random mutation. Already slap them with, with research showing that there is no random mutation. And then slap them, slap them with the video that I showed you. <laughs> and that's the end of it, right? Is that the end of it? Because there is random mutation. Show me that uh, replicative errors are non-random. Show me. Explain to me. You don't know what that means, DNA replication. You don't know what DNA is. Explain to me. Tell me. You don't need to, to debate too much with that. They come to you with the fossil record. I want people to, to, this is a very important point. They will come to you, where's the evidence for evolution? They will say to you the fossil record. You just, you just say the word. What in the fossil record is evidence for what you say? That's what you... All of the transitional species that perfectly align with the geological strata that indicate a very clear progression of forms from ancestral life to modern day. That's the evidence that you refuse to engage with. You're supposed to ask. You've got to peel one layer back. Say to them, what is evidence? They'll say, oh, these things in museums, which is all Lucy and all of the homo, homo, <laughs> all of these things. In the National Museum. All of these homo things. Okay, all right. I think here in, in London, uh, they're showing you all of these, these pelves of the whale. And they say to you, these are vestigial organs. This nonsense I'm showing you, this is what they're using in these magazines, this fictional type of skeletons that they're putting there, right? And they come to the layman who doesn't know uh, anything about evolution, and they come with this nonsense. So you have to be prepared as, as, as believers, you know? Okay, let's move on, inshallah. You could be a lot more prepared if you read a high school biology textbook. Now, we've done now with, with this everything which you would call scientific. I've demonstrated. Now, wh what did I do? Let's go back to the beginning. What did I do? I've demonstrated that whatever they call fossil record or evidence for evolution is in reality evidence against them, right? So you've demonstrated the fossil record is actually evidence against evolution. No, you did not demonstrate that at all. All of that is evidence for evolution. In particular, the fossil record uh, is tremendous. 
evidence for evolution. You just fumble all of it. We put forward the Cambrian explosion. We put forward how these species are 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 uh, actually evolving uh, in in very quick periods, and how it's impossible for it to happen on a long period. Uh, sorry, if it's not on a long period of time, it's impossible. And how the Cambrian explosion completely refused this idea. I put forward all of the fabricate. Not all, by the way. That I can go on and on. By the way, oh, just some thirteen only links of some of the fabrications that they put forward to to try to support the uh, the fossil record. Okay, so the, we move. On from the fossil record, vestigial organs. We put forward how these are all lies. These organs, organs are not vestigial. How it's even circular reasoning that you don't even take that into consideration to begin with, because it assumes already evolution is true. And when we say why do you assume evolution is true, they will say to you the fossil record. You go to the fossil record, they will go to you to vestigial organs. So you have to be very careful with these people because they jump from one to another. So you, you refute all of them to make them very clear that okay, there is no evidence for you calling evidence, right? Homology and blind natural. Study. We showed that homology is not evidence. It's actually the opposite as we showed with the, with the cichlid fish. We showed how natural selection is not blind, and it is guided, and they're not giving us an explanation how it is guided. Right? We showed that there is no such thing as random mutations. We showed research from their magazines, from their own beliefs, how there is no such thing as, as uh, random mutations. We showed how similarities in genetic makeup is made up. Okay, how You showed none of those things. Great work. Similarities <laughs> in genetic makeup is a concept that is made up. So the question is now, why do I get certain people trying to say, let's harmonize evolution and Islam? Bro, harmonize what? What theory of evolution do you want to harmonize? Which one? Which, which, which type of evolution do you want to harmonize? Which nonsense that they said or that they took, that they changed that you want to harmonize? Because there are rational people that belong to every religion, whether it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, whatever, that understand that science is valid and then they allow their faith to conform to what science has shown to be true. So this is another one of the things, I mean, look, there are religious people in science, there are scientists who are religious, there are scientists who believe in God, and they accept science. So you clearly are a class far below uh, those. You cling to your uh, baseless ideology uh, despite the overwhelming evidence that runs contrary to it. This whole theory is a bunch of garbage that is put on top of each other. If you have a, a trash can, why would I harmonize a trash can with Islam? And I want this is very important. Stunning. What, what a great analogy. Evolution is a trash can. What they try to take away is the acceptance in the heart of the believer. You know, before all of this nonsense of evolution, if we go to the 1800s, and we go to a layman, and we say to him, look at the trees, look at the ants, look at these animals, how their evidence is for God. None of them would object. None of them would, they would say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, all of these things are evidence. There has to be a maker that guided them to do that. Yeah, and if we go back thousands of years, we, we knew literally nothing, and we go, oh, the lightning bolt is Zeus throwing the lightning from the clouds. We used to not know anything, and then through the scientific process, we begin to know things. Like you're actually, you're actually pointing at past ignorance as evidence for current knowledge being false. You're like, we used to not know things, so the things that we know now aren't true. Like <laughs> that's like, I can't even wrap my head around how unbelievably dumb this kind of argument is. That's why Fir'aun, when, when he asked Musa alayhi salam, قَالَ مَا رَبُّكُمْ يَا مُوسَى Who's your Lord, O Moses? قَالَ رَبَّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَذَا Allah is the one who is given everything, its shape of creation, its creation, and then guided it. Allah is the one who is given everything, its shape, its creation, and then guided it. This is the Lord that we worship. Why is evolution being put forward? Because it goes against this idea. This natural innate thing in the human being to when he looks around, he knows there has to be a creator and maker for all of that, right? So what, what did we do today? We showed how this whatever rubbish nonsense that they're calling evidence, it is not evidence for them, rather it is evidence for against them. And they have to explain to us who guided these mutation, uh, th these genetic uh, things that are, are not random mutations, who, how these mutations guided mutations, directed mutations happening, how this natural selection happening in different environments or organized, how it's happening, why the, 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 all of these species evolved quickly and not on a, a prolonged period of time, how are they evolving and, not, and, and, and all of these changes are happening in the body 
and there is no one controlling them, you have to explain all of that and you have to give us an explanation. Now, it is... It's called the field of biology. Look into it. On them to ex explain the, these things to us. And as I said to you, if I'm speaking with someone who believes in evolution, I'm not going to go into all of these. It is too much for him. I'm just going to say, why do you believe in evolution? You know, start showing me your evidence, your research, and one by one, what he's presenting, I'm going to refute, right? All of those things that you've listed there that you were completely in, uh, unable to refute. This is a simple way to deal with it, okay? So that's what we established now. Now, moving on to, to what we call, it's a very important thing that we need to keep in mind now. The rational problems with this idea of, uh, of uh, evolution, right? And uh, by the way, I'll put number two as number one, but I changed them. I'm going to start with number two then instead of number one. Okay. The theory... Or, oh no, sorry. Number one is is the, is the is the correct thing. Yeah, number one is the correct thing. Number one, number one. they're very similar in, in the, the explanation of what I want to say. Uh, so, yeah, number two. Let's start with number two. Okay, number two. It is not falsifiable. The theory of evolution is not science. Right, so it's linked to the first point that I want to make. Right, that is pseudo science. They're they're linked. The theory of evolution is not science. You cannot falsify the theory of evolution. Why? I've already demonstrated two examples in, in, in this tree. I've demonstrated to you whenever there's uh, uh, something that comes up that goes against whatever they believe, they change it. This is oh, this is complete crap. We're, uh, uh, evolution, or the evolution is not science. It is the cornerstone of biology. Biology is, science, is a science. It's the cornerstone of biology. This idea that it's not falsifiable is ridiculous. You have no clue what you're talking about. It is absolutely falsifiable. Find me, find me two species that are that are intended that that are proposed to exist in the same genus that are ge that with ge uh, just their genomes are totally dissimilar. Like they have completely different uh, polymerase enzymes, and ju just like all of the enzymes are completely dissimilar, such that there's no way that, 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 that they could be evolutionarily related, and yet morphologically they absolutely must be closely evolutionarily related. That would be evidence against evolution, right? Find me, find me humanoid forms in Precambrian strata, Right? That would be evidence against evolution. Why is it that the strata so immaculately show the process of evolution over geological time? Show me species that violate that process. That would be evidence against evolution. It 100% is falsifiable. It just hasn't been falsified because evolution is true. Right? You just don't, you won't lift a finger to learn about any of these things. You just are so clueless about every app. Like you don't like you don't understand literally ninth grade biology. You were you were using uh, genetic gen genetic codes and and genes uh, interchangeably. You don't know, you have no clue what you're talking about. That's the problem. They changed the goalpost. They come up with a new name, a made up name, to try to explain whatever happened. Which means that there is nothing in that theory that is falsifiable to begin with. And this is a huge rational problem. That makes it, it's not science to begin with. Why? Because they rely on... Biology isn't science, you guys. The presuppositions of naturalism. Everything has to be explained through natural processes. They don't accept that there could be anything unnatural, metaphysical, that explains the phenomena that happens. That is how science works. We look for naturalistic explanations of phenomena that we see in nature. That is just, we, science does not presume supernatural explanations ever. That's just how science works. If you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with science in general. So don't pretend to be working within the confines of science and critiquing the, the scientific process. You're just rejecting science. You are science deniers. That is what you are. So, I mean, at least embrace that, right? Based on that false assumption that they already started with, the theory, it cannot be falsified. I already sh sh showed you that with the circuit fish. I've already showed you that with the, with the fossil record. How when, when the, we, the Cambrian explosion happened, they change it. How, how the, the homology, when, when we show them that homology is not due to common ancestors, they change it. How we show them it's not due to environment, they change it, they change the name. Every evidence that they will put forward, they will change and they will claim as if 
the theory is still valid. All they're gonna say, oh, some of them happens this way. You did not explain anything. They don't change anything, and they explain everything. You just refuse to listen to what they're saying. Evidence or anything. So anything which you will try to put forward against evolution is not falsifiable, which by default disqualifies evolution from being a scientific theory, because evolution is not a scientific theory to begin with. Evolution in its crux, in its understanding, it's not a scientific theory. Why? Because it's pseudoscience. It is not something that you can see, you cannot observe. I cannot observe species changing from one another. I, it cannot happen. And they claim because... False. We have observed speciation. Google it. Because of gradualism, we already defeated this idea of gradualism, but they will still use it as evidence. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, because of gradualism, you cannot see. Okay, you claim that there are some species who can evolve quickly. Why are we not seeing them today? <laughs> Why are no species today evolving? We do observe that, particularly in microbial life. We observe rapid uh, evolution, rapid evolutionary change. We observe speciation. Google it. Learn something. Quickly so we can observe them and see the changes that take place. Right? So it is pseudoscience because it's not under the scientific method. It's not under experimentation, repeatability, and falsification. I cannot experiment under a, a species that is changing from one to another. I cannot repeat the experience and I cannot falsify the theory because whatever you come up with, you will claim it is something else. And it's all based on pseudoscience, like I showed you. All of this idea of Homo habilis, Homo, homo erectus, all of that, they have uh, like chapters of stories. Oh, the Homo habilis was walking in this part of the region, he made the Homo. All of these fictional stories they have, it's pseudoscience, not science. That's not. It's not fictional just because you say it is. We find these specimens, we learn about their anatomy and physiology, and we discern things about when they lived, how they lived, how they behaved. That's how science works. So when you come back, when you, when you try to denigrate the entire field of biology or anthropology or whatever it is with nuh-uh, you just look like an idiot. Actually try to engage with the body of scientific knowledge. Try it sometime. How science is conducted. You don't find a, a, a tooth and then say that there's this creature existed and he was walking, he was mating, and he was in this region based on finding a tooth. That's not science. That is now. Yeah, and we don't do that with a tooth. We do that with hundreds upon hundreds of complete specimens, nearly complete, right, and nearly entire uh, skeletal remains. Hundreds of them, that's what we do. Oh, using, you can call it philosophy, call it whatever you want. But the, sci the, the, the theory of evolution is not a scientific theory to begin with. That's something that we need to look into. And whatever science that they're using, is already refuted, right? So this is the first two two ideas that I'm putting forward. And this is very important. The reason behind the demonstration that we put forward is to make this idea clear in the minds. If something is unfalsifiable, you cannot ask me to falsify it to begin with. That's why I, you have to ask them for the evidences for them claiming it is true to begin with. Because all of the evidences are refuted and, and they're all manipulated. So if I have a building that is falling apart, you cannot focus on which part of the, of, of the rocks that are prob problematic. The whole building is falling apart. And if there is no evidences for it, it's not science to begin with. That's why whenever you go to one thing, they will move on to a different thing, to a third thing, a fourth thing, right? Now As you do when you go through your links and don't even click on any of them and just jump from one thing to another and have no clue what you're talking about. Now, another thing is the idea of randomness. We've already refuted there is no blind, blind natural selection or random mutation. But the idea of randomness itself, randomness doesn't exist. Randomness doesn't exist in reality. You cannot prove to me that randomness exists. Randomness is basically the lack of our explanation. I... Randomness doesn't exist. Okay, roll some dice and tell me, predict the outcome, right? Predict for me with statistical significance the outcome of 100 dice rolls. I bet you can't do it. I know you can't do it because if you could, you'd be a multi-trillionaire. You would have gone to Vegas by now and you would have killed it at craps. Uh, so what are you talking about? What are you talking about not random? Uh, I have no clue what you're saying. I flip a coin, it's not 50-50%. I just do not know how much pressure I'm putting in. I do, I do not know the gravity. I do not know which side I'm pushing the coin. If I were to know all of these factors, then there is no such thing as randomness. Therefore Even if you did know all of those things, there'd still be such a thing as randomness. There's a thing called quantum indeterminacy. At the most fundamental level, matter is probabilistic, not deterministic. 
We're not going to, I mean, you guys don't even know what DNA is, so we're not going to try to blow your minds with quantum physics. Not even that I'm an expert on it to begin with, but I definitely know enough to know that uh, everything you're saying is objectively ridiculous. On the fundamental level, matter is probabilistic, not uh, deterministic. For the cannot, the whole theory is based on randomness, and we've refuted already the pillars of randomness, random mutation, and all of that. And if idea of randomness itself is wrong, you cannot base your your theory on something which doesn't make any sense because nothing is random. Everything is happening in a causal chain according to your beliefs if you're a naturalist. So you cannot pick and choose and claim I'm a naturalist when it comes to this part. But when it comes to this part, I'm not going to accept naturalism. I'm going to claim that there is this hidden force that is called chance and randomness. Right? So there's no, no such thing as called randomness. The whole theory is built, built on assumptions. As we said, the tree of life is based on the genes and homology. And we showed that the genes and homology have nothing, are not evidences for anything. Homology is not evidences for common ancestry. And the genes are not uh, as similar as they claim that they are. So where does this whole idea of tree of life come from? It all falls apart. Abiogenesis. It is an assumption they cannot explain. Where is the start of, I didn't even go into that. I can go into details. I don't want to, right? Where is the start of all of that? Of course you didn't go into details because if there's anything you understand less than biology, it's chemistry. Uh, anybody watching this probably knows the 10 hours of content I've made humiliating James Tour. So if you want to talk about a biogenesis, go look at that. Where is the start of the first? How did carbon start to grow in hands and the leg and what, hands and legs that started walking on? And we've got what we have today. Hands and legs, right? Where, a, a biogenesis needs to make hands and legs, you guys. You're not skipping any steps at all. You're not skipping... Two billion years, of course, hands and legs, you moron. You wanted to say something, Brother Sifu, yeah? Can I mute? Because you're muted. Yeah, but uh, you, you, your flow, man, your flow is good. I don't want to mess around with it. <laughs> okay, okay. You have dope flow, bro, dope flow. Halas, and and the, la the last thing I want to I end up with this is, is the idea of the changes, or, or the one before the last, the idea of the changes in science. They would claim that all of these changes, all of these articles that you provided, is evidences for us because it shows how science is uh, is uh, is is changed. This is the biggest nonsense that they will come up with. Right? That's why I left it as the last point. Never accept this garbage from them. This is true if you have already pillars, foundations of the theory that are undisputable. And then you've got branches that sometimes happen that needs explanation that you might explain in an evidential way. That's what science is. Do not make them come and break the whole thing is nonsense. And because science is changing, we're going to change the nonsense every day a bit by bit. And this is science. What do you say? You This is like, oh my God. I think what he's trying, like, I think he's trying to denigrate science for the fact that it changes. Is that what he's saying? Like, that's how we know it's valid, unlike the religious dogma that you blindly follow. It's just like, they, these guys, like... Like, it's at a point where they just sort of, like, rehash talking points that they've heard from better preachers and then just fumble them while giggling. Like, that's what this guy's doing. Do not be fooled by that, Muslims, right? Because this is a very common nonsense that they will come up with. They will come and say, this is science and science is changing. That's why. No, 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 Habibi. It's not that. It is that you've got no evidence to begin with. You've got no foundation of the theory. You've got nothing that is well established so we can base on it the theory and then look of explaining certain things to begin with. So never ex accept this nonsense of the of what they would call change of science, right? Mm -hmm. And let's go now to the last thing, inshallah. Okay, the last thing I want to say is, is how do these people explain what they say? You've got someone like Richard Dawkins who would try to explain abiogenesis by aliens. I want to I wanna just highlight the psyche of these individuals, right? Why, why do I want to highlight the psyche of these individuals? Some people will come and say, why, uh, if you've got all of this evidence, why don't you win the Nobel Prize, man? Just go and <laughs> demonstrate all of this and win the Nobel Prize. The reason is those people... They do. Uh, the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine uh, sometimes goes to people who, who perform developments in uh, evolutionary biology. I think in a couple of years ago... 2022, I think uh, the the it was uh, about uh, extinct hominin species. It was specifically about human evolution. That's what the Nobel Prize went to. You like you like you're gonna make a statement like that about Nobel prizes, and you don't even look at like what the past five years of Nobel prizes were. 
Like, this is how arrogant these people are. Already believe it, and they don't want to believe in anything else. Evolution to them equals no creation. And because evolution to them equals no creation, they will fight with everything to try to prove their nonsense. Because they don't want to believe in God. And many of them believe science is against religion. Many of them are from Christian backgrounds. They've been had bad experiences in their religion. Generally, they don't want religion. They want to move away from religion. They already have this assumption. So they would accept aliens. Someone like Richard Dawkins would accept aliens over accepting that there is a creator, an intelligent maker of the universe. They would not accept that. They would accept things like intelligent matter. This article that I put by science, they try to attribute intelligence. To Astro, it's just like the projection here is just out of control. Like they're trying to ascribe dogma to empirical science to mask their own dogma, right? They're like, oh, they need to believe that no God exists. No, like tons of scientists believe in God. Tons of biologists believe in God. You need to believe in a super duper, in a God that made you super special the way you are. That's what you need to believe. That's your ideology, which is why you reject science that proves you wrong. That's what you do, and you project that onto rational, educated people. That's what it is. Choice to matter. They would attribute intelligence and choice to matter, but they would not <laughs> attribute it to the creator of matter. Why? Because they're coming from the presupposition of naturalism. That's why you can never disprove these people because they will always say to you the only explanation we accept is the natural explanation. They will come from the hidden assumption. They will go to the extent of accepting aliens, accepting uh, matter to be intelligence, cells, microbes, viruses, all of these things are intelligence and that's how we have mutations. That's how we have the first cell. That's how we, that's how we have mutations. That's how you don't know what mutations are. It's, there's no assumptions. We have evidence for naturalistic explanations for everything. We have evidence here. You don't engage with it honestly. You just throw out jargon that you don't understand and then just kind of giggle and go, nah, -uh. that's what you do. We have uh, things happening in the universe. They will use anything, anything except the, uh, a creator that created all of that, that guided all of that. And now the last thing I want to show is this is this documentary, The Expelled, right? I genuinely warn people, anyone who's doubting that there is a specific agenda happening because of evolution in the scientific community, that they're pushing away anyone who goes against them, anyone who's got this idea that anyone who, who tries to use God or creationism and evolution or, or deny any of these things, anyone who's got any doubt that this is not happening, watch this, this documentary. It's available on YouTube. Actually, let me open it. I'll just watch this is the beginning of it, maybe. Hopefully we didn't get copyrighted or anything. I don't think we will, right? <laughs> but let, let's just watch this, uh, just the beginning of this. If we're co if we're commenting on it, we won't get a strike. Yeah, yeah, we are commenting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are genuinely commenting, actually. So. Well, alham alhamdulillah, I, I know some of the people who are in the documentary, so I'm sure they won't. Yeah, alhamdulillah. I'm sure they okay, won't, yeah. let's play yeah. just a part of it. Not much, okay? Yeah. So here's the documentary. It's called Expelled. No intelligence allowed. Okay? Just watch it. Don't don't accept my word for it. Just watch watch what they say. To move on from the music. There's only one skirmish in a much larger war. Science simply makes no use of the hypothesis of God. Ask yourself, what is intelligent design giving us? Nothing. We cannot accept intelligent design as an alternative scientific theory. They will never accept that we have a better argument. They just pester us and they waste <laughs> our time. Now I'm going to leave you in that cliffhanger, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. leave you guys in that cliffhanger. <laughs> Wow, what a cliffhanger. A bunch of biologists that are frustrated by the incessant nagging of crea of creationist trolls that don't understand science. They're going, whoa, why do we have to deal with this stuff? And they're like, ha, ha, ha. Like, that's like some kind of win for them. It is astounding that you would play that clip as though it supports anything you've ever said. Yeah. Seriously, watch that. If yeah. you really want to see if those people are genuine in the research and what they do, you already heard some of their statements, yeah? Watch that. 
Look how those people, no matter what, they're not going to accept any alternative explanations. Right? Mm -hmm. And I rest my case. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Mashallah. That was a very beautiful presentation. Um, and the reason I didn't want to interrupt you is because I've done presentations before and someone interrupts your flow. You forget where you are and, you know, it, it stops things. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, I, I mean, one of the things, Muhammad, which is very interesting about the way that you presented is that there is a lack of trust now from the general public. If they were to take what the, the information that we have here and process it properly, there's a lack of trust with what some of these Darwinists are saying, because essentially... There is so stop saying Darwinists. Just stop saying that. Much shoehorning. There's so much reverse engineering. There's so much ad hoc rationalization. The fact is, sometimes we just gotta get to the 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 root of the issue. The root of the issue is they've already assumed Darwinism to be true from the onset. They've just assumed it to be true. That's why when it comes to similarities between the two genomes rather than being honest and saying one genome is bigger than the other we can't really do a right uh, sort of comparison they just make all these assumptions and deletions and substitutions and say hey look at the similarity they don't do any of that you just have no clue what they're doing you're just completely and utterly clueless buffoons that have no idea what biologists do at all without telling us what that similarity means, because similarity in and of itself doesn't mean anything. And likewise, mm -hmm. randomness, the evidence, you know, you gave the good example of uh, Dennis Noble, but we have uh, James Shapiro with natural genetic engineering, who's speaking about how most of the mutations are not actually random. They're actually directed by the organism itself. Um, so then you have people like Lynn Margulis, you have people like Masatoshi and I, so many atheist scientists who are coming out and saying this is garbage it doesn't make sense then you have atheists like are they saying that because i bet that they're not and i think that you're just saying that without basis academics like jerry foda who um you know in his book what darwin got wrong he spoke about the 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 pressure in academia to conform the pressure not to challenge darwinism and he's an atheist <clears throat> likewise you have thomas nagel another atheist philosopher who speaks about how uh, Darwinism uh, has created uh, Darwinism within academia has created a situation where you can't really question it. And I think the real issue here is whether you look at the data or you look at the scientists themselves, this is not a normal theory. This is not the way that science normally operates. This it is precisely the way science normally operates. Yes, you can't question evolution because it is a thing that happens that we observe happening. Chemists can't question the existence of atoms. Physicists can't question the existence of electromagnetism. These are things that we know exist and happen all the time. I'm sorry. Something very dark about this theory and there's and, and that particular aspect of it you only really start to understand when you understand that Darwinism feeds into atheism and atheism feeds into Darwinism. They nope, most scientists believe in God. Most scientists are not atheists, including biologists. That's a lie that you tell all the time. Sorry. I have this relationship, and that is absolutely key. One last thing I just wanted to add is please go back and watch the stream. And when Muhammad's giving his presentation on the various different issues, pay attention and take notes. For example, one of the things he mentioned right at the beginning was about gradualism right and why gradualism is so important according to darwinism if things didn't work in numerous slight successive modifications khalas that's the end of darwinism you have to have gradualism as he showed you actually don't have gradualism you have punctuated equilibrium you have cambrian explosion that's the new, you have... new, the new, new fancy term uh, by the way i had a list of you have both you have gradualism and you have punctuated equilibrium they both happen Depends on the un environmental stimuli. N neither of you have any idea what those terms mean. You don't know what you're talking about. All of the evolution, 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 all of the new terms. I, I didn't bring it. I forgot. There's a whole list I made of all of the Lance's new the new names. Evil, evil, evolution. All of these new Lance's that they brought. Just trying to explain. So it's not like evil, evil, devo. It, it's a branch of evolutionary biology. 
Like, you don't just say a f- term and go, it's ridiculous, the <laughs> evil Devo. And that you like you don't even know what that means, let alone can you can you refute anything in Evo Devo? Like I just my god. Um it's astounding. It's breathtaking. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely, because they're trying to they're basically trying to fill up the hole. And you know, gradualism is to Darwinism what Tawheed is to Islam. If you take out Tawheed, there's no Islam. If you take out gradualism, which in the fossil record doesn't exist, as Stephen Jay Gould pointed out. Gradualism exists everywhere in the fossil record. What are you talking about? Fish to tetrapods. All of the hominin species you were pretending don't exist. These are all examples of gradualism. It's literally everywhere in the fossil record. You are clueless morons. So gradualism is not what you see then th- that is sufficient to debunk darwinism everything else is not important after you've already debunked it using that but each one of those things whether it comes to the problems in terms of how they work with genetics or whether it's, it's uh, sociobiolo- sociobiology and the problem with evolutionary psychology it's wrong every single time so jazakallah uh, khair muhammad uh, you know the presentation was fantastic what i want everybody to do is to learn from this presentation spread this knowledge because fundamentally we want people to believe in allah and the strongest evidence the strongest evidence for the existence of allah is found within nature now we as human beings we have a fitra that's why we believe in allah that's why an atheist calls out upon allah even if they're on a ship and they've never been taught about dua however what awakens the fitra is actually things like the design argument. We should be happily using the design argument. We shouldn't be shy about it. We should be confident in using it. Because actually, say, like, something yeah. important in the design argument is this is the most used argument in the Quran. Yeah. Because it appears this is something that some people neglect. It's not just an idea of your of your ranking of what is a better argument. But the idea is that for what the Quran used the most. Because this is what appeals the most to the natural human na- nature of the human being right That's and right. Uh, what happens why are not you uh, why are we not using it because of evolution right so the point is we need to stop doing that what we need to do is just to challenge those who would if we use the argument and they bring forth evolution we need to challenge this idea to show them they brainwashed to believe in what they believe in That's and right. actually no That's right. things are designed things the brainwashed toddlers are accusing the educated people of being brainwashed what delicious irony are not just designed they're perfected they are perfected quite are they perfected the imperfect biological specimens are are somehow perfected you want to uh, somehow justify all the imperfections of biological life and 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 explain to us how they're perfected created right oh, sorry absolutely. I no, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That's exactly the way I would say it. And confidence is extremely important here. And where does confidence come from? Confidence d- doesn't come from just prepping yourself up, getting yourself into a state or going to the gym. Confidence comes from knowledge. Confidence comes from practice. Confidence comes from opposing the other side, looking at their arguments and refuting those arguments. And confidence is something contagious. Because but you guys are completely clueless asshats, and you're confident as hell. So where did that come from? And you should bottle it and sell it. You'll make a fortune. Because once people see, wait a minute, this guy's using design argument. He's not getting refuted. He's refuting the other side. They start using it. And ultimately, what we need to realize is that shaitan is using certain things to try and take people away from Allah. And one of the things I believe, I truly believe, sh- shaitan's been using over the last 150 years is Darwinism. Yeah, and the link between Darwinism and Masonry. I don't think there's a doubt about that. No, I don't think there's any doubt. Yeah, yeah. Ab- well, you know, w- what's interesting is that when we look at the way that this theory scares the crap out of people, Right, certain people they're like, no, 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 uh, I don't want to talk about this, yeah. But it's 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 really, it, I mean, the, the the analogy you can think of is like this, right? There's an extremely scary looking dog, right? It looks like a Mongolian lion, right? It's 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 got these, you know, huge face, hair all over the place, you know, three hundred pounds. However, 
every day you come out of your house, this dog starts barking, you run back inside. That's what Darwinism's like for some people. Absolutely. Absolutely. For some people. Absolutely. However, one day, if you just walk out of your house and you let the dog attack you, you realize it doesn't have any teeth. Right? It's toothless. Right? That that's exactly Darwin. It doesn't have any teeth. It doesn't have the power that it you're describing religious apologetics and projecting that onto actual real scientific knowledge. Pathetic. Actually, it realize it's not a dog at all. You've been, hearing a, a no dog. You've been hearing a noise, but it's not there. You know? It's a chihuahua. You're scared to it's come out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's it. It's a chihuahua. It's so, a chihuahua. So, yeah. so uh, brother Muhammad, you, you came to the studio late to come this to, to yeah. do the stream. I don't want to hold you back. Jazakallah khair. Is there any last is message you want to give well. to the any last message you want to give to the people before we end? Well, I, what I want to give to the people is is let's let's have what we call beneficial knowledge, right? So let's actually not be sitting down for one hour, 14 minutes, listening for the sake of listening. Let's actually try to do some uh, research, opening the links that I have already put, put forward for these things, looking into these issues. More oh, you want the viewers to open the links that you yourself won't open and never read. Detail and understanding, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've summarized for you the, the, the problems. I've summarized for you the evidences of how to refute. I've given you the links. You, you literally don't have to do anything. You just have to understand the points that I was making. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to read anything. You just have to listen to the lies I said, and uh, everything will be fine. Why these problems are problems, and why are these the pillars of the theory to begin with? So there is no theory without them, right? Once you understand that, khalas, you've, you've done it, right? Uh, and I think Brother Sabur is tired. Some people ask him any questions. No, Brother Sabur is tired. He's not going to take any questions now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would do the stream longer, but I've got work tomorrow morning. Absolutely, That's the problem. absolutely, yes. absolutely, absolutely. But, but Muhammad, uh, I, I love your stuff. Keep up the good work. Lofi, Mashallah, yeah. I'm very Barak happy. Lofi. I need to come down to Leicester Square and join you. I need to watch Inshallah. you in action, inshallah. Barak Lofi, yeah. inshallah. Barak Lofi. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the things I think which is important for young people uh, to realize is when you equip yourself with information, you will have more confidence. Sometimes people ask, why are these people confident? Why is Muhammad Ali confident? Why is it? It's, the confidence doesn't come genetically. Your confidence, you're, you're confident because you're delusional narcissists who have convinced yourselves that you understand science better than scientists, even though you couldn't pass a middle school science quiz. You're completely delusional. You are uh, egomaniacal charlatans. That's why you're confident. That's why. The confidence comes from, from education. You Absolutely. Know, you, you spent a few hours putting together this presentation, but it wasn't a few hours, Muhammad. It was actually a lot of work you did previously, and you were yeah, just absolutely. summarizing it. Do you understand? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, absolutely. You know, and how much, I mean, for the people, how much work do you put in, like, you know, when, when it comes to these types of uh, things? Do you, do you basically set aside a certain time of the day where you do research? How do you work it out? Me this guy's never done research in his entire life. He Googles things that he wants to find, and then he accumulates links that he thinks supports them but don't, which he doesn't realize because he's scientifically illiterate and doesn't read anything. Personally. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I've got a specific time of the day, right? Or then let's not just say one because the, it depends on, on what I'm doing. Like, for example, there's a specific time for Quran, for example. And, and there's a specific time for for uh, reading a specific book. And then there is a specific time for general research on, on all of these different topics, right? Atheism, et cetera, science and uh, cosmology, all of these issues, right? Point is, if you have a system, you stick to the system. Like, for example, if I have after Fajr, I'm going to do my, my, my Quran revision, right? Which includes Tafsir, for example. If I'm doing it for, for 30, 40 minutes, Mm -hmm. Then every day I'm doing it for 30, 40 minutes, right? I'm not asking you to have the biggest, you can be working and do the system that I'm doing, by the way, right? Because I'm doing, you know, I'm doing so many things, right? Point is, it's not that you don't have time. It is that you're wasting your time on the wrong things. Absolutely. Spending, yeah, and I just say to the people, just open your phone, click screen time. 
screen time is an answer to how much rubbish you're reading on a daily basis or probably listening to things which are not important right especially if it's in this tiktok and this nonsense right so point is this just make a system for yourself one yeah. and a half hour one and a half hour a day simple right i if all of us can have one and a half hour a day i doubt that no one doesn't have one and a half hour a day Keep, right. keep it after prayers so you remember you don't lose the time keep it after prayers okay yep. let's say half an hour after fudge half an hour after after us and half an hour after Isha. but stick to them stick to them don't say i've got this thing to do therefore i'm going to ignore my 30 minutes of today and i'm going to do this thing this is where we got our issues right is the commitment so wallahi 30 minutes will go so much we will go so much you will look you will finish books upon books and the more you read the more quicker you read you'll finish books upon books you'll finish complete a complete amount of research if you memorize the quran you'll be memorizing the whole quran if you stick to that this is my my method this is what my teachers have taught me you just have a specific time of the day it's all about commitment if you commit to it you will get the benefit the problem what some people do is that they want this is what this age of technology have taught us you want maximum amount of knowledge in the shortest amount of time this is what people started to have in their mind i want in two hours now i understand everything i want in two uh, i want to read this book and now i'm able to do that one kind of like how you read absolutely nothing and pretend to understand entire fields of science all right some people ask me which book do you recommend so i can do that brother it's, it's not you open the door you close the door it's not it's not like this right and and that's what our teachers taught us it takes time do not look at the mount. Look, mount is a mountain. But if you start taking one rock by one rock, the mountain is gone before you know it. Don't look at the mountain and try to move the full mountain. This is what people do. They want to get the max, so many, so much knowledge in short amount of time. And when they don't, they give up. If That's you're right. consistent, and you spend a small amount of time, like Allah Azza said, the most beloved these Allah are small, are small, but they're consistent. Even if they're small, even if they're small, but they're consistent. The consistency is key. If you're doing the consistency. You will get the knowledge, but you don't. Ha it doesn't matter how busy you are. You've got one and a half hour in your day to do. I'm telling you. Absolutely, that's that. That's the best advice. Allah loves those things which are consistent, even if they're small. So, Jazakallah Khair, the Muslim Barakallah Lantern, Muhammad Ali, Barakallah for joining me on this live stream. I sure notice. I would say, and uh, no until next time, I'd love to have you back again, Inshallah, inshallah for something inshallah, in the future, Inshallah. inshallah. So, Jazakallah Khair, may Allah reward you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. That's the end of the video. Holy hell. Um, uh, the conclusion here, what is the conclusion? Um, creationists, and in particular these two creationists, are the most pathetic, willfully ignorant toddlers imaginable. They pretend to debunk entire fields of science, such as anthropology, while refusing to learn or engage in any way whatsoever with the actual field of science they're discussing uh and all of it because it's a uh, a uh, uh, belief in god is not enough for them right they're, they they pretend that that darwinists are all atheists no there's plenty of people who understand basic biology that also believe in god it's just that you guys need to believe in this god that made you super special exactly how you are um, because you need, because you're egomaniacal and you're afraid to die. That's pretty much what it is. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you, you, I, I, to be honest, I thought, so everybody told me about the guy Sabor. I thought he was going to be talking the whole time. Instead, it was this other guy, uh, who was like a freaking like a cackling hyena like it was unbelievable the guy has no clue what he's talking about and he's just giggling the whole time it was very that was grating that that was difficult to to get through um honestly it is it's 2 50 a.m it's almost 3 a.m i'm tired um that was ridiculous i hope you got something out of it i don't know if i did or not but um, I think what we definitely did conclude is that there's absolutely no difference whatsoever between Muslim creationists and Christian creationists. It's all the same answers in Genesis crap. It's just a bunch of willfully ignorant toddlers talking about things that they've never lifted the finger to think about. So that's it. Um... Thanks for watching. Goodbye.